Welcome and thank you for joining the FOIA Advisory Committee. I'm going to turn the conference over to David S. Fierro, the Archivist of the United States. Please go ahead. Good afternoon and welcome to the first meeting of the fourth term of the Freedom of Information Act Advisory Committee. I'm David Ferriero, Archivist of the United States, and I join you from my office at the National Archives Building in Washington, D.C. If we were not in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, I would welcome all of you committee members and attendees alike in person to this beautiful building, a shrine to American democracy. In addition to housing our nation's founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights, the National Archives and Records Administration also provides a permanent home to every statute signed into law since America's founding, including the Freedom of Information Act and the Federal Advisory Committee Act. The National Archives is pleased to charter, host, and support this important advisory committee, not simply because of our role in maintaining FOIA and countless other U.S. statutes. The FOIA Advisory Committee's task of advising on improvements to the administration of FOIA complements the National Archives' strategic goals of making access happen and connecting with our customers, from federal agencies to the American public. The committee's work also ties closely to FOIA's mandate that the FOIA Ombudsman Office, the Office of Government Information Services, here at the National Archives, identify procedures and methods for improving FOIA compliance. Although Congress passed FACA in 1972, as advisory committees have played an important role in shaping public policy since the earliest days of our democracy. President George Washington is credited with first using outside experts for advice. Facing an uprising in western Pennsylvania over a whiskey tax, the first ever federal tax on domestic, a domestic product, President Washington appointed an ad hoc group of commissioners to investigate the Whiskey Rebellion of 1794. The commissioners met with concerned citizens and ultimately advised the president that enforcing the task would require, quote, the physical strength of the nation, end quote. Federal advisory committees are one of the few formal ways for private sector citizens to participate in the federal policymaking process. Such committees have advice on everything from organ transplant procedures, drug approvals, and stem cell research, to drinking water standards, space exploration, and federal land management. Earlier this summer, OGIS delivered to me the final report and recommendations of the 2018 to 2020 term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. The committee identified and approved an unprecedented 22 far-reaching recommendations seeking to enhance online access to information, improve FOIA and records management training, raise the profile of FOIA within agencies, and embrace new technologies. I've entrusted OGIS with fulfilling some of the recommendations and tracking the progress of other recommendations. And I am particularly pleased that some of the recommendations marry records management and FOIA. As we have often recognized, a strong records management program is the backbone of an excellent FOIA program. Please know that I don't expect another 22 recommendations or even half that at the end of this committee's term in 2022. I welcome your advice and participation in helping to implement some of these recommendations over the next two years. Much work is ahead of you, but I'm impressed with your broad experience both inside and outside government and your deep commitment to making the FOIA process better for all. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge these difficult times we're in as we continue to physically distance ourselves from one another and our workplaces and adapt to life's challenges in ways that tax our minds, bodies, and spirits. Please take good care and stay safe. And I turn the meeting over to the committee's chair, Alina Sima. Okay, thank you, David. Really appreciate it. As the Director of the Office of Government Information Services and this committee's chairperson, it is my pleasure to also welcome you to our inaugural meeting of the fourth term of the FOIA Advisory Committee. Um, I have a few opening remarks. I'm going to talk really fast because we've lost a little bit of time uh, due to our technical difficulties. I apologize to both the committee and our attendees for that. 
Um, let me take a second to also introduce the committee's designated federal officer, DFO, Kirsten Mitchell. And uh, I've asked her to help me stay on track today. I know she will. Uh, I hope everyone who's joining us today has been staying safe, healthy, and well. Um, we do have a packed agenda, uh, and I will, again, keep my opening remarks very brief. I want to welcome all of our committee members. I'm really glad to see that we have a full house today. And I want to express my gratitude up front for your commitment to studying the current FOIA landscape and for developing consensus recommendations for improving administration of FOIA across the federal government. We are going to take a roll call very shortly, so stand by for that. I also want to welcome our colleagues and friends who are watching us today via WebEx. Despite today's ambitious agenda, we will leave time at the end for public comment. We look forward to hearing from any non-committee participants who have ideas or comments to share. And we always welcome written comments. We will open up telephone lines at the conclusion of the committee's deliberations, and OGIS's Deputy Director, Martha Murphy, uh, is monitoring our chat function throughout the meeting. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to chat them at any time. Martha can read them uh, at the end. Uh, public comments, suggestions, and feedback can be submitted at any time by emailing FOIA-advisory-committee at nara.gov. Uh, moving to the virtual meeting space has challenged all of us, but we are happy to let everyone know that we are also attempting to stream this meeting on the National Archives YouTube channel today, and we will post the stream on the FOIA Advisory Committee website. A few housekeeping rules before we get started. Meeting materials for this term will be available on the committee's webpage. Click on the link for the 2020 to 2022 FOIA Advisory Committee on the OGIS website. We will upload a transcript and video of this meeting as soon as it becomes available. Members' names and affiliations are already posted. Member biographies will be posted in the near future, um, as will a complete set of all 30 recommendations this committee has made since its inception in 2014, along with their status. Since March of this year, we've held several meetings virtually. Uh, we anticipate continuing to do so in the foreseeable future. Uh, whenever we do get the green light, we will once again meet on the stage in the McGowan Theater. But until then, the virtual environment is our friend. Um, and the virtual environment has some advantages, including much shorter commutes for all of us, uh, very casual Fridays, um, as well as Mondays through Thursdays. Uh, the disadvantage for me and Kirsten is that we will not be able to see you, the committee members, raising your hand or eagerly leaning forward, ready to make a comment or ask a question as we would if we were on stage in the gallon. Um, I will be doing my best to monitor committee members' non-verbal cues during the webcast, uh, but we all need to be respectful of one another, try not to speak over one another, um, although I realize that's inevitable at times. I want to encourage all committee members to use the all panelists option from the drop down menu in the chat function if you want to speak. Uh, you can also just chat me and Kirsten directly. Uh, but in order to comply with the spirit and intent of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, please only keep uh, communications in the chat function to housekeeping and procedural matters. No substantive comments should be made in the chat function. Uh, they will not be recorded in the transcript of the meeting. Also, if you need to take a break, please do not disconnect from either audio or video, especially now that we're all up and running. Instead, put your phone on mute and close your camera. Send a quick chat to me and Kirsten uh, to let us know if you're going to be gone for more than a few minutes. And join us again as soon as you can. We have uh, noted a 10-minute break at approximately 2.25 p.m. We'll have to see where we are in our agenda, but I do promise to take a 10-minute break. Um, and as a reminder, for purposes of our transcript, please identify yourselves by name and affiliation each time you speak. This will help us down the road with both the transcript and the minutes, both of which are required by the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So this seems to be a logical time to do a brief roll call. Uh, I would normally solicit each one of you to introduce yourselves, but in the interest of time, we're going to do a quick roll call. Uh, Kirsten will do that next. Uh, we'll save the introductions for our next meeting. Uh, and before we get started, you may be seeing a new face and name on your screen today. Lubna Haddad is joining us from uh, Defense Intelligence Agency. Um, she is a last minute substitution, graciously accepting uh, David's nomination to fill one of our 
government slot. So please help me in welcoming Lubna. She is able to, to join us for the beginning part of our meeting today. I'm going to turn over to Kirsten now to provide uh, the roll call and a brief introduction to the FOIA Advisory Committee's bylaws and responsibilities. Kirsten, over to you. Thank you, Alina, and welcome everyone. Um, I apologize if you are hearing any background noise. It is pouring rain here in Washington, D.C., and it is um, causing a lot of noise on my uh, skylight. So I apologize for that. So I will go through and just do a quick roll call. I think we have everyone here, um, but Roger Ando from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. If you could just let us know that you're here. Hmm. We don't have Roger. Pardon me? We don't have Roger. We had him earlier, but I do not see him on. Does anyone else see him? I don't see him. I do not. I'll check on that just and keep on. Okay. I do see you. Roger. I see him as a panelist. Roger, are you there? I don't see his picture, though. Right, we don't see you on camera either. I'll reach out to him for your chat. Okay, thank you. Um, next, Alan Blutstein, America Rising. Here. David Collier, University of Arizona and NFOIC, the National Freedom of Information Coalition. I'm here, thank you. Thank you. Allison Dietrich, U.S. Department of Commerce. I'm here. Kristen Ellis, the um, Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'm here. Thank you. Linda Fry, Social Security Administration. I'm here. Jason Gart, History Associates Incorporated. I'm here. Thank you. Alexis Graves, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Good afternoon. I'm here. Great. Lubna Haddad, U.S. Department of Defense, Defense Intelligence Agency. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. Kel McClanahan, National Security Counselor. Here. Thank you. Michael Morrissey with Mucklock. Here. Alexandra Perloff Gilas, New York Times. Hi. Yes, hello. Hello. Juan Samahan, Villanova University. I'm here. Great, thank you. Matthew Schwartz, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. I'm here, thanks. Thank you. James Stoker, Trinity Washington University. I'm here. Great, Tom Sussman, American Bar Association. Here. Great. Bobby Talibian, U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Information Policy. Hi, I'm here, thank you. Thank you. A.J. Wagner with Marquette University. Here. Great, and last but not least, Patricia West with the National Labor Relations Board. Hi, I'm here. Okay, super, so I'm gonna feel like a teacher on the first day of school. Um, I'm going to circle back up to Roger Ando. Is Roger with us? I have not received a response yet. Okay, super. Yeah, if you could keep checking in on that, that would be great. Um, so as Alina mentioned, I'm going to go over some um, bylaws and um, responsibilities real quickly. Um, so I just want to take a few minutes of your time. Uh, we sent a two-page summary to all committee members, and we also have that posted on the FOIA Advisory Committee website, which is accessible at archives.gov forward slash OGIS, that's O-G-I-S. So this committee, in addition to being governed by FOIA, also is governed by the Federal Advisory Committee Act, also known as FACA, and the Government and Sunshine Act and transparency and openness are the crucial aspect of both of those laws. And in that vein, I want to let everyone know that all committee 
and subcommittee emails must include the FOIA advisory committee email for record keeping purposes. And that, um, I think Alina read it earlier, but I will go ahead and read it again. It's FOIA-advisory-committee at NARA.gov. So the committee's charter and bylaws are both posted on the FOIA advisory committee website but I wanna go over a few things very briefly in the bylaws. So while most of these meetings are, these full committee meetings are the most public facing events, if you will, the committee will have subcommittees and each subcommittee will have two co-chairs. One is a government member and one is a non-government representative member. Um, so we find that that's a really great way to get um, the membership balance working together, um, and that is in both the charter and the bylaws. Um, a quorum, it constitutes two-thirds of the committee members, or 13. We have a history of great attendance um, and look forward to that um, continuing. So along those lines, committee members, your responsibilities are pretty straightforward attend all meetings of the committee and the subcommittee or subcommittees of which you are a member, submit items for committee and subcommittee agendas, um, deliberate in a collaborative manner with fellow committee members, and advise the archivist on FOIA-related matters. And finally, for you federal members, um, submit finance confidential uh, annual financial disclosure forms for ethics review. And thank you to all of you who have already done so. I think we're just missing one of them. So a little bit about public comment. All full advisory committee meetings must be open to the public and the public must be permitted to present oral public comments unless otherwise noted in the Federal Register Notice that announces the meeting. Um, and to those of you um, attending today's meeting, please know that written comments may be submitted to us at any time, and we welcome those. Um, a little bit about the voting. Any committee me member, including the chairperson, Alina, may make a motion. No second is required, but Alina appreciates a second. Um, so pretty much there's a unanimous decision. Every member present has cast a vote in favor of or against a particular motion. General consensus is at least two thirds of um, total votes cast and general majority is a majority of votes cast. So that was a real quick overview of, of the bylaws. Um, and I just wanted to go over a few of my responsibilities as the designated federal officer. I am here to uh, ensure efficient operations, ensure compliance with FACA, the Federal Advisory Committee Act, and other applicable laws and regulations. I attend all committee and subcommittee meetings. So we will be seeing a lot of each other in the coming two years. And we will, um, I'm also, prepare and approve committee meeting agendas, maintain records of committee activities, ensure transcripts and minutes for each meeting, and share in any meeting when directed to do so by the archivist. So that sounds like a lot, but I wanted to let you all know I have several National Archives colleagues assisting me. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Krista Lemelin, who works with me at the Office of Government Information Services on FOIA compliance issues. I'm also really thrilled um, to have Kimberly Reed. She is a public affairs specialist for the National Archives Office of Legislative Archives, Presidential Libraries, and Museum Services. And she will be detailed to OGIS to help us with committee work. And finally, um, and some of you have met uh, Rana Kandakar, who's in the National Archives Office of General Counsel. She is our um, ethics attorney and the government folks heard from her during their ethics briefing earlier this week. Um, finally, one of the things I love most about working at OGIS is bringing together FOIA requesters and federal agencies 
and I'm thrilled to see the committee bridge that FLIA community. Um, finally, I'm here to help, so please don't hesitate to contact me. Um, if anyone has any questions, I noticed there's one from Kel McClanahan in the chat about um, can we give someone a proxy to vote? And the, there is, there's no provision for that in the charter or the bylaws. Um, so, so the answer to that would be no. So um, any questions? Otherwise, I will turn it over or back to Alina. All right, thanks very much, Kirsten. I really appreciate it. I'm uh, trying to move things along. Um, so prior to our meeting today, Kirsten, and I asked all of you to give us your top two or three issues you would like the committee to consider during this term. Uh, we shared uh, those with you yesterday. They are also now posted on our website for all of our attendees. And uh, not surprisingly, several of you identified issues related to FOIA and technology. That is why I have asked the co-chairs of the Chief Boy Officers Council Technology Committee um, to join us today to tell us about the exciting work their committee has already accomplished and will be taking on in this coming year. My ultimate goal is to balance the work of our two committees and avoid duplication of effort as much as possible. The Technology Committee was formed in September of 2018 as a result of a past FOIA Advisory Committee recommendation. Originally a subcommittee, we have elevated elevated their status to a full committee. So, so far they're the only committee. There might be more. I am very pleased to welcome the co-chairs of the Technology Committee, Eric Stein and Michael Sarich. Eric is the Director of the Office of Information Programs and Services at the State Department. His office is responsible for the Department's Records Management, FOIA, Privacy Act, Classification, Declassification, library and other records and information access programs. I am now exhausted. Uh, Michael is the Veterans Health Administration's FOIA director, leads a program with over 300 FOIA and Privacy Act officers who handle 25,000 plus requests across 151 facilities worldwide. Uh, I know that Eric uh, has a hard stop at two. Hopefully he can stay maybe till 201. Uh, Michael promised to stay a few minutes uh, behind uh, in the event that there are questions, and I hope there will be. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric and Michael. So we need the slides up. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to come and present. My name is Eric Stein, and I'm joined by my colleague, Mike Sarich. Mike, are you available? And we have put together a presentation about this wonderful technology committee uh, that we've been so fortunate to co-chair over the past almost two years now already. Uh, so as we uh, go through this presentation, uh, we have an opportunity for uh, questions and answers at the very end, and I just want to get right into it. So about us, as Alina pointed out, we were created by the, uh, uh, we were created about two years ago, and we have really grown. We started with maybe just about a dozen agencies and now have approximately uh, 40 members from 25 different departments and agencies. It has been a great experience to have so many uh, different FOIA professionals working together uh, and to, to share perspectives with regard and a real focus on technology. Uh, with an accomplishments for year to date, well, earlier this year, we, we released our report with best practices and recommendations. Uh, it's, it's posted on the OGIS website. And we're very happy to say that we're making, we've either completed a couple of those recommendations or are making progress in, uh, to complete the rest of them. Uh, additionally, uh, Michael and I participated in the OIP Best Practices Workshop uh, on FOIA and technology. Uh, I believe that was in April of this year, right when the pandemic started. And we really received a lot of excellent feedback from uh, FOIA practitioners about the issues they're facing uh, within the FOIA programs uh, across the government, as you know, Agencies are large, they're small, they deal with diverse record types. Uh, so the perspectives we got from our, our, our colleagues who work on FOIA uh, helped to enrich the group and, and to, to get more specific, the challenges they faced, um, many of them working remotely uh, and some for the first time ever. So technology and the role of technology was already critical, but that much more critical as a result of uh, events as they unfolded across the world. Uh, 
we mentioned we added about 25 new members this year, and that has been wonderful. It took us uh, a, about a month or so to establish a governance structure, which we'll be hearing about shortly, uh, into different working groups to really leverage the full expertise of so many members who uh, we want to take full advantage uh, of their expertise and experience in the different areas, the working groups, uh, the, in the working groups we've created. Uh, again, Alina's point is noted, and we didn't want to uh, duplicate, we don't want to duplicate with any existing efforts. So a lot of our job is often to play facilitator. Agencies and practitioners are wondering, who, I had this question, but I don't know who to ask. And if it's technology related, of course they can always go to OGIS or OIP, but with the network we've created, and it's nice because we have a range of employees across all different uh, you know, ranks and levels. Uh, we, we've created a nice network of people who are willing to and really want to help one another succeed, uh, whether it be in their specific programs, program areas, or just cross-cutting issues. Um, so we look now at the uh, FOIA working, we'll talk about the FOIA working groups in a moment and the working group charters because uh, we're, a fan, we're fans of creating governance structure, but we want to make sure we're clear about what our working groups are doing. We don't want nebulous uh, 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 objectives or tasks. We want to say, here's what we're working on, here's where we're going. And if we ever come up, if you ever have ideas or recommendations, or we went through the list uh, that you've already provided, uh, a lot of the topics you've raised are already things we're looking at. We are happy to drill down harder on some of those topics or back off if their existing groups are already doing that work because there's there's so many aspects of technology that are so, so important. We can go to the next slide, please. So here we have the eight technology working groups. Um, and uh, what Mike, Michael and I will do is go back and forth. We've divided them up and we've found chairs and co-chairs for these different groups from across the interagency to discuss, uh, uh, to, to lead and to uh, participate in these efforts. So while there's overlap on some of the topics and themes, we've carved out specific taskings for each one of them. And we, we also encourage committee members, of course, to uh, work across their working groups in the bigger sessions uh, to make sure that they're aware of what each other, is aware of what the other members are doing, but also to help inform the efforts they're specifically working on. So for FOIA searches, uh, that is an effort dedicated to the search of electronic records. and. Electronic records, as we know, is, is where we are. It's not the future. The future is now. We're here. So a lot of agencies have expressed interest in best practices when, when it comes to electronic records management, tools, uh, how do we, and really drilling down and focusing on FOIA, how are those tools leveraged to conduct the best possible searches? Now, if you do a search on certain terms in electronic archives and databases, you can be inundated very quickly with 200,000, 2 million, even more records that are potentially responsive to requests. And we have to bridge this gap between the wonderful ability to search so much electronic records uh, in, such a, in such a quick way to finding what requesters really need in a timely manner. So that group has um, a, a nice uh, range of employees from across um, uh, different FOIA programs looking at large agencies, small agencies, and different software tools that are uh, uh, being used for those searches. The next two here are FOIA Express and FOIA Online. And for those, I just want to point out, we don't endorse any specific tool, um, but rather these are two that we found that are used by a lot of agencies. I want to see, Michael, are, are you on the line? Yeah, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Sure. Yes. Thank you very so much. Michael, over to you to talk about those. Sure, great. So um, one of the great things about this, um, this iteration of the of the tech committee are these lanes of effort and these a technology committee work working groups and so it makes sense to talk about the FOIA Express and the FOIA Online one um, together. One of the things we're attempting to do here is communicate. Com, um, sorry, is create communities of interest. Um, and again, as Eric mentioned, we're not endorsing any particular product one way or the other. But what we want to do is bring those folks whose agencies have chosen to use these products um, together, so they can share best practices, resources. Um, and, and the like, so they're not duplicating and reinventing the wheel. So, for example, if um, the Veterans Health Administration and VA have created great training products for FOIA Express, um, then they can share those, share those out. And likewise, if the Social Security Administration has created great training products for FOIA Online, likewise, they can share those out with, um, the, for example, the Department of Interior. So that's what we're working towards there in the, um, 
in, in, those, line, in those lines of efforts, and we're going to be excited to share with you um, some of the preliminary findings in just a second. So we'll talk the back for artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence, AI, a, a very popular topic. The question is how do we leverage it in FOIA and how do we do it effectively? So what we've been doing is looking, we have a group looking at records management practices, AI and government in the private sector, and looking for implementable solutions in the short and long term to leverage concepts like machine learning. Uh, another concept that they're looking at is what's called technology-assisted review. Uh, these are different ways that agencies, get, well, while not necessarily AI, uh, they are AI-like concepts on how do we leverage technology better to actually do the searching and review of records in an effective way. And they're all types of considerations for AI. That's a very interesting group, and we're working to possibly have sessions in the future with FOIA practitioners uh, to introduce them to the concepts of AI, because I think for a lot of people it's a frightening thing. They go to the worst possible scenarios or what, what this could mean, or uh, but rather we have to look at how can AI be leveraged to really help work with people whether it be FOIA practitioners, the public, requesters, across the board, to make FOIA programs better in the future. And with that, Michael, 508 compliance? Sure. One of the things that you hear in, um, in the FOIA space frequently when you go to ASAP or you're talking with colleagues, uh, you know, across the community are challenges with 508 compliance. We have all of this information that we're either obligated to under the Rule of Three or that we would like to post proactively. However, that dreaded 508 compliance piece comes up where folks are a bit concerned or reticent about putting things up and putting their agencies at risk. So what we're looking here to accomplish is to provide a, a suite of tools, a, a set of guidelines, best practices, ways so we don't have to be afraid of posting these things proactively online, these records that we really want to get out as part of the transparency community to the larger requester community and indeed the, the public at large. So we're really looking forward and excited to the work of the 508 compliance uh, working group to be able to provide some of those hard tools for, for the FOIA professionals in, in our community so they can have those in their toolbox uh, moving forward. Great. And now FOIA and classified information, uh, there are a, a host of issues uh, technology related that agencies have raised with us, those that work with classified national security information, and we wanted to look at what tools are available right now that agencies are using, and while some of the other areas we just mentioned, like AI or the different software tools or searches or key factors, there's some unique classified issues that uh, agencies uh, wanted to discuss. And so what we're going to do is continue to reach out to other agencies that work with classified information and uh, pro pro provide options and solutions to some of those challenges. Um, so back over to you, Michael. Sure. So another um, kind of emerging issue is collaborative tools. Many of our um, Many folks and many agencies are moving to Microsoft Teams. A lot of us during COVID moved to, uh, to Zoom calls or to ZoomGov or to other um, platforms as quickly as possible. So the question then arises, are we creating records here when we're using these collaborative tools? So for example, if a, if a Skype message might have a very short retention schedule and might be gone, you might not have to necessarily worry about it in a FOIA request, well now maybe in the Microsoft Teams environment, how is that going to impact and implicate your operations as a FOIA program. What do you need to do? What do you need to be aware of in that in that space to make sure that you're capturing, um, you know, inappropriate, conducting your appropriate search, search and you know, reasonably calculating to un, to discover all of the relevant records there. So, part of this is also an employee awareness, making sure that employees, federal employees, understand that what is what records are and what what they aren't. And then part of it is also how are we going to deal with the deluge, which we expect to happen. From Microsoft Teams chat and from other um, from other of these collaborative tools that come on come on the scene. So that, that's a big uh, that's going to be a big and emerging piece as we're constantly looking to increase our efficiency as agencies by embracing these um, collaborative tools working together, especially in a distance setting. So that's we're really looking forward to the work of, uh, of this group. And then video redactions, Michael. Do you want to? Sure. And then so what we thought we would do is we would um, go ahead and provide you with some of the early findings. So kind of demonstrate the work that we've accomplished so far in this, um, in this real, relatively short amount of time. So if we can move to the, to the next slide, we'll give you just a kind of a quick sampling of some of the early, uh, five early findings that we found um, from the video redaction working group. And in the interest of time, we're not going to go deep into each of these, 
but just you can think of this as kind of the, the teaser of a trailer of a kind of coming attractions. So, um, so briefly, first we found that video redaction retention schedules can vary across platforms and across, across agencies. So something that might be held, a closed circuit uh, camera television uh, piece might only be held for 30 days because then the, um, the drive will loop over and it'll start again unless it's flagged in that time period. So video re record retention schedules can vary from um, agency to agency and from platform to platform in inside of that agency. Uh, tools that FOIA professionals are using vary in complexity. There's some tools that can be purchased where you can, you know, basically do the next version of Star Wars on your computer. You can do all kinds of crazy, crazy things in it, but then you might need to have that, that level of tech, George Lucas-like expertise in working with video software to make that work. So kind of making the tool fit the, fit the job is an important piece because we've seen, um, you know, we've all gotten new products pushed to us and it got all kinds of bells and whistles, but you just need to do one thing. You need it in the FOIA space to maybe um, blur, the, blur the faces and blur the, um, or maybe change the sound. So we wanted to do those two things. We don't need to put, uh, you know, rainbows and stars and all the rest of it, uh, you know, in there. So making the tool match the job, or matching the tool to the job is very important. Litigation, we found, can drive video redaction schedules and agency resource allocation. So some folks might not have a video, have any tools at all. Some agencies have zero tools, but are then, based on a court order, have to stand something up from scratch. And that can be very challenging, you know, in a resource-constricted um, agency to be able to, we've been sued for this, now we have to do it. And I think the implication is if we, as, if as federal agencies we create the record, the courts will look at us perhaps to say, well, you created it, now it's your job to, um, to, to process it properly. Um, and this is where one of the, um, I think one of the recommendations that are going to come out is earmarking funds for FOIA contractors with specialized skills can be efficient because instead of hiring an FTE with video background and for one or two or five requests a year, allocating a certain percent, allocating a certain number in your budget to be able to go out and on a surge basis or an as needed basis to be able to hire that skill in could be very efficient rather than having FOIA officers spin their wheels spending a week or two to learn software that they may have a very limited need to, to be doing. And the last piece of this is, if you can't do that, as you build out your FOIA programs, consider adding video redaction skills to position descriptions and performance plans. We're always looking in the FOIA space to who we recruit. You know, how can we recruit people? Eric has great stories about working and looking for librarians, which I think is, makes, which makes a lot of sense. And you look at, you take those lessons and you look to see who we're bringing into this community of practitioners, and it makes a lot of sense moving forward as we look at this, you know, across the entire uh, FOIA space in the government to see if there's room for and if we can bring on folks with that, uh, video, those video redaction skills. And I think we'll see that um, more and more. So, again, that's just, a, that's just a quick flavor of some of the things that we've, um, some of the things that we've accomplished, but now we're going to talk about some of the next steps for our working group. So we'll throw that back to uh, next slide, please, and over to you, Eric. Sure, and, and just that so we can probably make up a little bit of time here. Uh, right now we're working to finalize our working group charters with clear deliverables. Uh, so we can say a lot of the groups are looking and doing research or doing outreach or looking at existing documents already out there from you know, whether it be previous advisory committees or just other findings. Um, so we're, we're doing that work right now and, uh, and we are uh, in a good place there. And then the next steps will be, of course, to implement those plans um, and to do a series, the series of actions you see here on the rest of the screen. Um, I think um, just for the sake of time as well, Michael, is there anything else you want to add before we open up for questions? Sure, just that this is a group, um, a very active group that is interested in, you know, um, talking about discovering but then implementing. We want to bring these tools to the field and we want to make sure that these aren't just, that we don't just do reports, right? We want to make sure that these get to the hands of the FOIA practitioners across the federal family and they're able to take these and improve processing across the um, across the uh, the spectrum, which is one of the great, which is one of the reasons I'm so excited for Eric and I to be here before the FOIA advisory committee, who often sets the tone and tenor for for improvements across the uh, across the field. So yeah, with that, I think we can definitely take questions. So thank you. Great. To ask a question on the phone line, please press pound two on your telephone keypad. Again, pressing pound two will indicate that you have a question. At that time, you will be unmuted 
and you will be able to state your name and ask your question looking to the phone lines. Not seeing any questions at this time. And you are also welcome to write your questions in the chat by sending a message to all panelists from the drop-down menu. Not seeing any questions in the chat or the phone lines. Well, we do want to say thank you again for the opportunity to present today. And as we continue to work on our process moving forward, we welcome the opportunity to come back and brief again or provide updates, uh, not just with the charters, but also with findings or any uh, recommendations that you may have. So um, if there are no questions, I just want to say thank you. It's always, uh, it's always a pleasure and we're always humbled to have the opportunity to come and brief this group or any group on the work that we're doing. Um, so thank you. So Eric, before Thanks. you jump off, uh, I know Cal McClanahan has a question for National Security Conference. Sure. Cal, go ahead, please. Hi. So listening to your presentation when you're talking about the search methodology and how to use technology to improve the searches, then you later on when you got to the video, you were talking about the, basically the records disposition schedule when, you know, the video may be deleted after 30 days or something. One of the problems that some of the bigger agencies run into, in my experience, is that they have such a backlog that they don't get around to tasking the relevant office to do a search until after the records you're looking for have already been destroyed. And so have you figured out or are you looking at a way to sort of use technology to allow a person to basically almost pre-search to go out and identify potentially responsive records for the purpose of putting a hold on them from destruction uh, until the time comes around for them to be processed in the order in queue? Sure. So you, you raised it uh, in the context of both search and the video redaction piece, but I, I, could just, I, I think it touches on several of the working groups. Uh, one of the things I just point out is uh, we found that um, electronic records are just, uh, they're proliferating. They, they're popping up in all types of different forms. And so agencies are, are, are having a challenge on how to preserve and follow records uh, schedules for these different tools and technologies. It's something we're looking at. I don't think we have a, a specific answer or I, we could take that, your point back to the committee to look at. Um, it's definitely something I think agencies in general are working through based on the conversations I've had. Michael? Yeah, I would just say, um, just to add to that, if you, uh, one thing that I like to reference is uh, James Holzer's uh, report on backlog reduction from DHS, which is fantastic. Um, he makes a point, which I think we shouldn't forget, is in, in his report that federal agencies are creating more and more records than they ever have. You know, we are constantly creating records, and it's a challenge to, to stay in front of the curve there to make sure that we're able to hang on to them for an appropriate amount of time to fulfill our transparency mission. So, you know, with, you know, Mr. Holzer's point of, point of view there, um, which I think is absolutely correct and on point. It is a huge challenge, and if you don't, if you don't, if you only have the resources to hold the material for 30 days before it um, stops, then right, you know, um, I agree with you 100% that that's a challenge for agencies, and certainly something that we can um, that we can address. I know that um, we just kind of gave you the top layer of some of the some of the um, base findings from, from the video redaction committee, but as Eric, I think, also correctly pointed out. That does touch a lot of um, a lot of the lanes of effort that we have on our committee this year. And to clarify, I, I was just using the uh, video as an example because that's what you mentioned. I, for instance, had a request that had a three-year destruction period on the record, and the agency didn't get around to asking the office until three and a half years later because of the huge backlog at the agency. And so this isn't even a short-term thing. This is a, you know, how do, to the extent you can, if you can figure out a way to front load some sort of uh, cursory search capacity that may not be as intensive as a regular search just for the purposes of avoiding this problem so that three and a half years down the road when you do the search, the office doesn't come back and say, we wish you'd asked us six months ago. When we yeah, and that's definitely, something our, and that's definitely yeah. something our committee could look at in terms of the tools and AI and the different capabilities that are out there. Yeah, certainly. Okay, I know Eric and Mike, uh, Mike will have to go shortly. Does anyone else have any questions before they, uh, they leave us? 
Um, for this is Kirsten, Alina, there are a couple of questions in the chat that I just thought I would read. Should we save those okay? to the end? Well, should we save those to the end? Since well, we'll one of them time? is from Alexandra. And she I'm not asked, going to ask the question if that's easier. Okay, no, thank you. Can ask, please. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm curious whether uh, the search capabilities of different agencies are made public anywhere. So I, I've had experiences where um, we give a Boolean string and are told that there are too many characters in the Boolean string, for instance. So um, that kind of technical information is, is helpful if that's available. And we, we can definitely take that back in terms of search capability. I think uh, agency, we did go through all the chief boy officer reports. Uh, we looked at what was shared there. Uh, we look at uh, what's also publicly available, but we can try to drill down for additional detail. Now it's definitely something we can look into. And I see another question asking about uh, how will the working group solicit feedback from the public. Um, uh, you know, the last slide here is actually has both my email address and Mike, uh, Michael's, and we welcome feedback and incorporate it. We actually love when people ask questions, uh, whether it be from the public or from agencies, because it's something to consider. Um, so it's really important. And um, the final question I see here is when will work, when do we expect to complete work on the recommendations in the February 2020 report? Uh, we, we, I don't have, we don't think we have completed deadlines yet, but we are seeing different initiatives that have been created throughout the government. And some of them are touching on what we're already, what we proposed and we're proposing. So we're just trying to figure out what role do we play? Do we, and what role do those initiatives that are underway play? So I think we'll just uh, keep an eye on them and continue to, to try to put finer points on deadlines in the months ahead. COVID did uh, put us in a tough situation where we, we, were, we were also working remotely with a lot of our colleagues. And I can say our technology, we were fortunate. It's, we've done our, our meetings and calls that were working so far. We've had a few issues that a couple of times. Uh, so it, technology is, uh, there's still challenges with technology. So, but we're, we're getting there. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, Tom Sussman, does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, but let me follow up. Uh, uh, although we don't have a specific deadline or, or date for uh, uh, getting back to the advisory committee, um, could we stay in touch with the technology uh, uh, working group on a regular enough basis so that uh, we get a little warning? Uh, that's that's an extremely important area. We invested a lot of time in it in the past, um, and I think it would be useful to be able to collaborate a bit with this uh, advisory committee uh, rather than just get hit with the final report sometime as we're, as we're wrapping up uh, year after next. Absolutely. I mean, y yes. I, Lee and I turn to you for confirmation here, but that Michael agreed. Absolutely. Yep. I think we can make that. And Bobby as well. Yes, yeah, so I'm my head too. Do we want to, this, is, this is Jason Gart. Do we want to formalize that somehow, um, something for each of our meetings? I'm sorry, Jason, I don't understand the question. Formalize? Let's formalize it in uh, reporting back in advance of each of our meetings for status no. during the last, you know, since the last gathering. Sure. And gathering I, you know, meeting. I don't know if we, I usually invite Eric and Michael when they have status updates. So we only meet four times a year as a committee. Um, there may be a subcommittee that gets formed that can keep in touch with them more regularly. Uh, I'm. I can certainly think about adding it as a standing item uh, if, you, if everyone else thinks that's a great idea. Do I hear a yes and or a no? I think it might make more sense to just, as meetings come up for us, to engage with Eric and, and Michael to see if there's something um, that would benefit for an agenda item. Yeah, that was my thinking too. Okay, thanks very much. And, and we're, and just, just so, we're always very happy to publicize all the things that we're doing. So, for example, um, as Eric mentioned, working in the, you know, different events that we may have, we're going to publicize those very widely and in advance, in as much advance as possible, you know, as soon as we're able to set, de set dates and, and so on. So, we're very much looking forward to an interactive process with all of our groups. So, you know, we're definitely much stronger together. Right. Next month, actually, we'll be holding a public meeting of the Chief Way Officers Council meeting, and Michael and Eric will be presenting there. So lots of opportunities to tune in and hear how much more they've gotten done in one month. Hopefully a lot. 
All right, guys, I know you have to take off. Thank you again for bearing with us with our technical difficulties. Really appreciate it. Thank All you right, and good luck. Take everybody. care. Nice to see everyone. Day. So I'm just going to keep moving. We are very lucky to have four returning members of the 2018-2020 committee uh, members with us. Uh, uh, Tom Sussman, Michael Morrissey, Patricia West, and James Stoker. In no particular order did I say those names. Uh, despite challenges during the COVID-19 pandemic, I am very proud to say that the 2018-2020 term continued to stay engaged and focused. And as David Ferriero mentioned earlier in July, we delivered to him an impressive 22 recommendations um, at that time. And uh, again, I wanna stress as David did as well, I don't think anyone is expecting another 22 recommendations in this committee term. Uh, and I think you're gonna hear a little bit about that from um, our four returning members, but we thought it would be very helpful and it would be beneficial to have you hear from um, each of those members about their experiences in the last term and uh, some other issues that they thought they would like to share with you. So uh, we're going to turn over to them to talk about some areas that we've tackled in the past, some um, areas perhaps that need to get passed on to our current committee. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to who's going first, Tom, James, Michael, or Patricia. Okay, I guess, uh, and let's see, I'm off mute. Tom, you're on, thank yes, you. Okay. Uh, I, I have to start by saying, you know, what uh, what a thrill it is to be back again. Uh, I've been involved, as many of you know, with uh, FOIA and related uh, access issues for decades now, but I learned so much over the past few um, advisory committee uh, uh, sessions that, uh, and today's a great example of uh, uh, so much still to be done in the technology area. Um, and. Um, uh, that was an area to which I came uh, with very little uh, background and uh, expertise, and uh, it's, it is so key to the future for records management, public access, proactive disclosure, that uh, uh, it, it's, it really is something that I, I probably have learned more than I've contributed um, uh, when it comes to that area. And I think... Uh, uh, we find that through surveys, interviews, speakers, uh, uh, meetings, uh, demonstrations, that uh, uh, we'll all learn a lot uh, in the next uh, months to come. Um, I, there have been comments about 22 recommendations from the previous committee. I think Alina said 30 total. Uh, I'm struck with the fact that the first advisory committee gave birth to one. So we are certainly not on an exponential path. There's no question about that. But I, but, but I can't help mentioning that even that first recommendation from almost, um, well, over five years ago has not been fully implemented. Uh, it was a simple recommendation to Office of Management and Budget concerning uh, updating the fee schedule consistent with uh, both uh, judicial and legislative developments um, and um, uh, while OMB has put out a, um, uh, a notice uh, on that subject, far from uh, really doing the job of updating uh, comprehensively uh, for the public uh, guidelines for uh, FOIA fees. So we can go back beyond even the 22 recommendations of the last committee uh, in terms of our look back and, and implementation. Uh, you know, and these are all extremely important. To, I think the creation of the technology working group and the uh, FOIA officers uh, uh, council is uh, emerged from our work in the advisory committee, and um, and I think we've got a lot, a long road ahead in terms of getting uh, recommendations adopted. So, uh, you know, I I think that interestingly, I went over the the priorities that uh, Kristen so, uh, 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 Kirsten so, so uh, 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 ably put together quickly for us on the spreadsheet that was sent out. And um, I, I wish we could cover all of them. Uh, they're, they're all great. But I think the more we focus on um, the work that's been done and building on that, um, uh, the more we're likely to accomplish uh, in the uh, 
during our term. Uh, and while the previous committees have expressed uh, their recommendations in a single report at the end of two years, I do suggest that we consider perhaps uh, uh, smaller groups doing interim reports, uh, perhaps not quite as uh, aggressive as, uh, as an entire volume that we've been putting together. Uh, you know, one example would be if the technology working group comes out with its uh, uh, final recommendations and responses to our recommendation, uh, that would be an occasion for us to engage and perhaps even come out with a short report based on what they've done. Another area relates to the coronavirus and pandemic. Uh, I think most of us have witnessed some changes in the way in which the government um, uh, has functioned. Uh, in some agencies, uh, major, in others, not. But um, uh, perhaps they need a short-term look at how we can get back to normalcy, uh, even remotely, uh, would be important. And it needn't take two years for this committee to do. So uh, those are just uh, throwing out some ideas. Uh, what an incredible array of expertise and experience we have. Uh, um, the committees, the committee acts with a, a consensus. Uh, we've, so far, our reports have been unanimous uh, with both government and private sector. Uh, and, uh, and I think there's no reason why we can't stay that way. We all share, despite our differences of uh, orientation, perspective, professional uh, uh, aspects, et cetera. We're here because we share a commitment to uh, access to government information, the Freedom of Information Act. And so I'm looking forward to uh, working with all of you as we begin this uh, uh, challenging journey once again. Thank you. Who's next? I, I can go next if you'd like. <laughs> Oh, that's you. You go, James. I'll follow you. Tom's the okay. to follow. So. He, he is the top one to follow, right? Um, absolutely. So, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, to my new colleagues, welcome to the FOIA Advisory Committee. I'm delighted to be serving a second term on the committee. Um, I'll echo what Tom said. It, it's a great uh, learning opportunity, particularly for me, who, as a, as a historian as a representative of historians and uh, historical organizations, right? That's not, that FOIA is not what I do most of the time. And so I definitely bring an outsider's uh, perspective and had uh, a fairly steep learning curve. So I'm, I'm glad to be back uh, a second time. Uh, the committee is important for a lot of, a lot of reasons. I, I think we uh, play an important role in ensuring the effective uh, functioning of democratic government, ensuring that it's, uh, the, 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 uh, it, is, it is transparent. And one of the things that really impressed me about the committee is the high level of collegiality amongst the uh, committee members. Um, I, I was very pleasantly surprised by it, um, especially since in many cases we sit on the opposite side of the FOIA request. So it's, uh, it makes a big difference being able to sit down and chat, uh, chat with, uh, with uh, someone who, who uh, sees FOIA from a, a different perspective, particularly when your main experience is waiting years on end sometimes for a response, right? Or perhaps uh, your, your experience is, you know, fielding five phone calls in a week from someone who's very excited to see a response to their, their FOIA request. So I was very happy uh, about that and expect the same going forward. Uh, I, I also agree with Tom that it would be a very good use of our committee's time to uh, look back at what previous uh, committees have done, um, just because that work, uh, you know, does reflect a big investment of effort, and if there is no meaningful follow-up by, by, by a later committee, it's possible that uh, recommendations can, can basically fall by the, the wayside. Um, so I, I, I do echo that. At the same time, the new members of the committee bring uh, a great deal of experience. They bring new perspectives, fresh energy, and so I think we also have to make room for new issues to be addressed. Um, I'm, I'm a little bit aware of that because I joined the committee a bit late last year and uh, wasn't able to play a role in setting the agenda of, of the committee. And so I think that, uh, that there's some issues that, that, that I personally would like to see addressed, and I know that uh, based on the priorities you all submitted, you, you feel the same way. 
Uh, for me, one uh, good use of our time would be to look at the impact of the security classification uh, process on, on, on FOIA and FOIA requests. Many of you know there's a separate process, mandatory review requests for requesting specific classified documents, but uh, FOIA requests are often concern information that is uh, is classified, and agencies are, are thus obligated to review classified documents as part of their responses to these uh, requests. I'm interested in gaining a better understanding of how uh, this process of uh, a classification uh, and declassification review impacts Freedom of Information Act uh, requests, ultimately with the goal of expediting the process for requ requesters. There's a lot of different directions that this could go in. Um, I think uh, I think one question that could be asked uh, at, is just uh, just basic understanding of the of the impact of classification on FOIA and access to information. I mean, obviously, it takes time to review classified documents, so it ends up slowing down the request process. But I don't think that we have a very good sense of the scope of this issue. So, um, basic questions like how many FOIA requests across government concern access to classified information. These are things that we, we essentially don't know the answer to. What is the average processing time for these requests? What percentage of that time uh, of, of processing is, is going towards declassifying uh, the material? Um, all of those are, are questions that could be of relevance to, uh, to people interested in um, improving the administration of the FOIA. And I think there are things that, uh, that our committee uh, could explore. Uh, second, there's a well-known and widely acknowledged uh, problem of overclassification of information. Uh, all across the government, far too many documents are unnecessarily classified, uh, as the declassification process itself so often often reveals. Sometimes it takes months or years to uh, to, to clear relatively uh, banal information, and um, and it's not clear how seriously the, the impact of this is on the FOIA process. Um, so is it possible to measure the impact of this phenomenon of overclassification on FOIA? Um, that's uh, another thing that the committee could look into. And then finally, perhaps most importantly, what measures could be taken to reduce the impact of classification on FOIA requests? So one possibility would be to look at uh, general steps that could be taken to reduce the backlog of documents in need of review. Uh, but I think that there are probably other advisory committees throughout government that are looking at this issue. And as our, our speakers a little bit earlier um, pointed out, it's not always a good thing for um, various advisory committees to do redundant work. Um, so uh, it might be fruitful to look at specifically how this happens in FOIA requests. Are uh, FOIA requests at different agencies placed into a separate uh, queue for declassification? Do these receive prioritization with respect to other requests? Are they they're relatively deprioritized? What should an appropriate process look like? How do other countries around the world handle such issues? And what can we learn from this? I think these are all uh, questions that uh, we would uh, we would do well to, to look into because I think there is a large community of <clears throat> the requester, uh, <clears throat> or a large portion of the requester community that is interested in in uh, such uh, such uh, matters. Um, in terms of the, the scope of the inquiry, we could look all across government. Um, but I think that could be a little bit complicated. <clears throat> One lesson that I learned from uh, last term is that while we are all very capable individuals, uh, we have limited resources in terms of time. The committee does not have a professional research staff to uh, to assist us with, uh, with with these inquiries. And so, if the scope becomes too, of our inquiry becomes too large, uh, we can easily get sidetracked and, and maybe not be quite as successful as we would like to be. So one, one way in which we could proceed would be to pick um, a set of agencies to look at and uh, get a better sense of how classification impacts the FOIA process at these particular agencies. As a historian, I would be very interested in looking at NARA, uh, but uh, I would be open to talking about uh, other, other agencies that could be included uh, as well. I see Kel has uh, made a comment that we could make a motion to hire research staff. I wish that were possible, but <laughs> I think probably not. Um, and uh, if this is an issue that other committee members are in, I'd love to hear your ideas on uh, what an inquiry into classification could look like. Thanks very much. All right, thanks. Patricia, you want to go next? Yes. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Patricia West. I'm the Acting FOIA Officer and FOIA Public Liaison at the National Labor Relations Board. 
I had the honor of serving on last term's FOIA advisory committee. And like the previous committees, um, our committee had three uh, subcommittees, time volume, vision, and records management. I uh, spent time on the time volume subcommittee as well as the vision committee. Also, I was a part of the, the final report working group. And so I want to share with you that you can be on more than one subcommittee, to, you know, depending upon your interest. Um, as you've heard, <laughs> last term we, uh, we came out with these 22 recommendations, and at the conclusion I didn't think that I could contribute anymore um, to the committee. Uh, but then, in the final report, Jason Barron wrote a section entitled uh, Final Observation, um, in which he su makes two suggestions for our current committee. Um, the first suggestion I know uh, Michael's going to touch upon, um, but the second suggestion um, is what I wanted to visit, and it uh, echoes what Tom and uh, James were saying. Um, so. Since uh, Jason is much more eloquent than I am, I'm going to read um, from the final report. Uh, as challenging as it has been to fashion these recommendations, the more difficult part is in seeing through their effective implementation. Without intending to bind members of any future term of this committee, we have one further suggestion for the committee to consider. Rather than viewing their mission as one primarily involved in drafting many additional recommendations, members should spend a portion of their time devoted to publicizing past recommendations and measuring slash evaluating compliance with them throughout the executive branch. And, and then, you know, Jason gives a few suggestions about how we could go about this. Um, so when I read this section of the final report, it, it really spoke to me and I felt inspired and I uh, wanted to come back and, and help with implementing these recommendations because um, we can make lots of recommendations, but until they're implemented, I, I don't think we'll see much change. Uh, so for me, I'm, I'm just going to make a suggestion. Um, ideally, I would love to have three subcommittees just devoted to following up on these recommendations. But uh, I understand we have all these amazing committee members who have excellent ideas for the FOIA, which will require some subcommittees. Um, so I'm going to make the proposal that we have at least one subcommittee um, to look at these recommendations. We could call it, you know, implementation of the recommendations subcommittee. We can workshop that idea. I'm not very creative, so, um, but under, under that particular subcommittee, um, I'm suggesting that we could have four potential working groups. Um, the first I would suggest would be training, um, which has three recommendations um, that, that that working group could follow up on. The second one I'd recommend would be online access, and this would be a combination of the three recommendations um, under the subject matter, enhancing online access, and also would include the two recommendations under the subject matter of providing alternatives to FOIA access. And then the third working group, I would suggest, would be a congressional working group. Um, and we have uh, two uh, recommendations directed to Congress. And my thought was that members of um, this working group and the committee could meet with members of Congress regarding these recommendations and actually draft the proposed legislation, um, you know, and hand it off to the 
the congressmen so that they could, or senators, so they could drop it. Um, additionally, Michael will be touching upon another um, proposed legislation that uh, we discussed a bit last term, and I thought this working group could assist with that. And then the fourth working group um, that I thought could focus on the subject matter of raising the profile of FOIA within the agencies, which has four <coughs> recommendations. And I would also include the two recommendations directed to the Chief um, FOIA Officers Council. Um, so uh, I kind of packed a lot in this one subcommittee in the event um, we're not able to have more subcommittees devoted to following up on the recommendations. So this one subcommittee would be um, tasked with the implementation or overview of, of approximately 16 recommendations. Um, so that's just my proposal. I'm just throwing it out there. And then um, I just wanted to share um, some tips or lessons learned that, that I learned from last um, something that I found really helpful was reading the final reports of each of the FOIA committees. Um, also, watching some of the meetings um, was really helpful, too, because you can get a flavor for the meetings and what is expected. Uh, keep in mind, though, every committee is different, um, you know, made up of different members. Uh, the other suggestion, um, or one thing I just want to comment on uh, that was difficult for me to get uh, to get used to was at these committee public meetings, which we're in now, um, before we speak, we, we were always told that we need to state our name. Um, and I believe, and Kirsten and Lena can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, this helps with the uh, meeting transcripts, and it also helps to introduce you to the uh, meeting audience. Um, but the most helpful thing I found um, were the resources that the committee has. And really and truly, the resources are the people, and they're the people that um, we are seeing right now on this meeting. Um, you know, we have uh, Alina and Kirsten who are present at all our subcommittee meetings, um, which last term at least were all conducted via teleconference. Um, and they're here to, to support the committee and subcommittees. Um, it's not their first rodeo, so, you know, please look to them for guidance. Kirsten really meant it when she said, call me if you have any questions. Um, they've been extremely helpful in pointing me and, uh, and my fellow committee members in the right direction for various research projects. Um, also, uh, last year's committee members, you know, um, Michael, James, Tom, and myself, um, would be happy to help. I can tell you um, I looked to Tom last year uh, he was a big help to me and several committee members. Um, we had two projects that were dealing with international research. One was um, international research on FOIA statutes uh, in, in different countries, and we looked to it to get ideas how to deal with voluminous requests. And another was we were looking at national models of agencies like OGIS. And um, we interviewed Tom. He was a great source of help. He turned us to um, this really helpful website and, um, you know, then set up another interview with uh, another gentleman who was extremely helpful. Um, and so, uh, so don't be shy about asking for help. And then the third um, <laughs> group of resources that are people are your fellow committee members. And I'll just point out, like last year, Suzanne Piotrowski, who's a professor at, at Rutgers, um, she 
really did a heavy lift in helping um, with survey results um, for one of the subcommittees. And Michael Morsey, who's the co-founder of MuckRock, was really helpful at giving us the requester perspective. And uh, James and I were on a committee involving the international research, and he's a professor at Trinity Washington University, and he's fluent in German, so he looked at all these uh, German um, statutes. So, so really, the people on this committee are going to be a huge resource for you. And then lastly, um, I would kind of keep your eye on the target. Um, for each of our subcommittees, uh, we need to complete a final report before the term ends. And so I would suggest um, keeping notes on your research and interviews so that you can describe your methodology and process. Um, the two years go by really quickly, and it's hard to backtrack and remember uh, everything that you did. Um, also, a, a really good subcommittee report uh, helps us create a, a stellar uh, committee final report. And I would just point to, if you wanted to look at a, what, what I thought was a really good example of a subcommittee um, report, I would um, suggest that you look at the record management subcommittee report from last term. It's, it's highly detailed, and it has legal support for each recommendation. Um, so that's it. That's the list of my helpful for you. Okay, great. Patricia, thanks so much. Michael, over to you. Oh, great. Yeah, I mean, I would I would just say uh, Patricia said it all, and I, I think so eloquently, um, except for the fact that she then said I was going to follow up on a few items, so I guess I do have to say something after all. But um, <laughs> I, I do want to just echo everything, everything she said, because I, I think that's a great summary of sort of what makes this uh, committee an honor to be on and, and a, a real wonderful opportunity, um, but also, you know, sort of how we can effectively do our work in a way that, that aids our, our field. Um, so I think uh, I'll start with, with sort of uh, some of the advice, because I think coming into the committee, I, uh, you know, I, I come from a very small nonprofit, and I think uh, government committees work a lot different than, than I've certainly been used to working. Um, and also, we're in a, a kind of an interesting place because we can't legislate, we can't allocate funding, uh, we can't get Amazon to donate color scanners to every federal agency in the country, um, <laughs> or really do anything directly, um, which can be frustrating, right? I think we, all we can do is provide recommendations. Um, I think uh, we can't sort of snap our fingers and, and fix any problems. Um, and our recommendations have to be directed towards the, the archivist. And the archivist also can't do a lot of those things directly um, either. Um, and even coming to the, the practice of a recommendation can be challenging. I think everybody on the requester side and, and everybody on the, the processing side both have some, some individual wishes that would make everybody's, their, their particular lives a lot easier. Um, but I think as a committee, we're really charged with sort of thinking through the bigger picture. Um, because I think the challenge of, of making recommendations um, that we can't necessarily enact directly ourselves is also an opportunity because we're not constrained with the political realities. We're not constrained with the financial realities. And we should be looking at sort of what do we need to do to kind of make, our, make sure our collective field is one that serves the American people as best as possible, what can we do to kind of create a, a healthy and vibrant employee ecosystem that serves the needs of today, tomorrow, and, and many years from now. Um, I also think it's a wonderful opportunity that brings together both the requester community and the processing community. Uh, the FOIA officers that I've gotten to know through the committee in, in the last term, um, just so, so many committed, thoughtful individuals um, and it's a real pleasure to kind of be working collaboratively on this, this project in a way that I think our, our field doesn't um, often get enough time and opportunity to do. And so being able to, to kind of work together on this project um, is really, really important and special space. And I'm, I'm grateful to get to be a part of it 
uh, again. My advice is to take some time to really listen to what is and isn't working for our peers on all sides of the issues. Um, this FOIA is a complex challenge. Uh, FOIA is not easy. It involves everything from document management to digitization to AI uh, to really tricky political realities and financial realities and also helping build strong cultural norms so that um, Congress and, and the public support the important work that needs to be done because this stuff cannot be done on, on a zero budget or, or zero political support. And so we have an intersection of a lot of really interesting different, different fields that come together. And so we have a chance and really a mandate to kind of take a step back and think through what do we need to do to make this work um, for everybody as, as best as possible. Um, as Patricia so elegantly said, the resources that the committee has uh, here are people and, and really wonderful people, people with a lot of different experience. Um, from speaking German to, to sort of years of experience kind of dealing with things on one side or another. And I think being able to tap into that and, and really kind of work to make sure that the experience that you bring to this committee is helping shape our recommendations, um, but also you're, you're doing what you can to sort of elevate the experience that other people have. Um, I think that, that's some of my favorite conversations where uh, people push back on, on what seemed to me like uh, obvious solutions um, and kind of took a chance to kind of explain sort of, okay, this is why we can't do that, or this is why this isn't really feasible. Um, taking an opportunity to kind of really listen to our colleagues is, is really wonderful. Um, and so I think I would just urge everybody on the committee, step back from sort of, hey, I really hate this particular exemption or, or um, this kind of specific problem and, and trying to think through what are the larger structural issues that we can help shift the conversation to address when it comes to uh, transparency and the Freedom of Information Act in general. Um, and finally, while we're delivering recommendations to the archivist, I think it's important to not necessarily limit our scope to just what the archivist to do. Uh, I think we can treat our work as yet another accountability measure when we look at how we want FOIA to work in two years, five years, and beyond. Um, you know, we, we tell the archivist, here's our recommendation, but that recommendation can also be uh, a calling to task. If we find, for example, that certain things are not funded in a way that makes them work effectively, I think we have an opportunity to kind of come out and, and say, here has been the cost of this. And our recommendation is that this is remedied because this is, is the historical cost um, for not doing this properly. Um, I think there's creative ways that we can use this sort of fact that we are a recommendation body to highlight issues that and help set agendas for other bodies that can then build on our work, right? I know that uh, when congressional staffers are looking at sort of how they want to sort of shape legislation, one of the things they do do is look at, at the recommendations. They do kind of use this as a springboard. So um, while it can feel that we are uh, sometimes held back, I think we can use this as an opportunity to sort of say we are not constrained in ways that, that other places are constrained. Um, yeah, so so that's kind of general advice is, is sort of use, use our constraints as opportunities. I think everybody working in the world of transparency and FOIA is very used to constraints um, and, and working with few resources. And so I think taking those skills and, and working with the wonderful people here is, uh, is a great path forward. Um, one of the things I would like to kind of, uh, you know, see a, a subcommittee on is the idea of extending FOIA um, and transparency laws beyond um, executive agencies to, to legislative and judicial branches as well. Um, I think that's, a, that's been a recurring topic that has come up in, in multiple previous terms. Um, I think that's, that's also something that a lot of members of the public have questions about, sort of, wait, why is Congress exempt? Why is the judiciary exempt from FOIA? Um, I don't think there's necessarily easy answers. I don't think this is just, hey, let's, let's make um, Congress subject to FOIA. I think Congress might have some thoughts on that themselves. Um, but I do think that this is something where if we uh, have a subcommittee fully devoted to this issue, we can come out with some really strong, strong recommendations, and maybe that is um, something that's more nuanced but I think it is something that we have seen come up recurring in terms 
and could really benefit from, from sort of a clear uh, suggestion or guidance to where we feel it should be so that it's, um, you know, something that, that the public should expect transparency and, and this is a way that we can feel this um, in other, other components of our, our government. So, um, yeah, I'm really excited to be working with all of you. I'm really excited to be working with the, the three other continuing members. Um, and this is a real privilege and honor because I do think that our work is not just in building a stronger FOIA, is not just building a stronger transparency component for our government, but is really essential to building an informed democracy. I think uh, right now people throughout the country have a lot of questions about a lot of things. Um, every day you see some of those questions getting answers or getting um, those questions being met through the power of public records, through the power of the Free Information Act. And I think we serve a really, really strong role in, in helping government of the people, by the people, um, really help be informed about making the best decisions for, for where we want to go as a country. So, so it's a real pleasure. Okay. Michael, thanks for that. Really appreciate all four of you weighing in. I, I was remiss in not recognizing Bobby Talibian, who is also a returning member, but um, by charter, not necessarily by choice. Uh, as the director of OIP. Bobby joined us pretty late in the ter last term of the committee, but he was always um, coming to our meetings in the past, so he was certainly familiar with the work of the committee. And uh, Bobby um, said he's good, right? Do you want to share anything else with, that, with the no. rest of the committee now? No, thank you, Alina. And um, in, in, um, glad to be here by charter, but also would be here by choice. Um, a lot of the work that uh, the department does in our government-wide policy position in FOIA is, is, is greatly informed by both uh, the agencies and the public. And so I had the pleasure of um, working with our prior director, Melanie, um, from the beginning of the, the, the committee, um, and then had the pleasure of actually joining last year. Um, a lot of great recommendations that um, both at OGIS and OIP are, are, are starting to work on. And so. Glad to be here and looking forward to more vibrant discussions and, and um, exploring how we can all improve FOIA all the way around. Thank you. Thanks very much, Bobby. All right, so we're a little past our agenda break of 2.35 p.m., 2.25 p.m. rather, sorry, but um, if I can ask everyone to keep to 10 minutes and return at 2.55 p.m., I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, just a reminder, Put your phone on mute and just shut your camera off, but don't log off because you may have trouble logging back in. See you in 10.
And we are live. Okay, welcome back everyone. Thanks again for keeping to our 10 minute break. Uh, thanks for returning and sticking in it. It's a long meeting, I know, and thanks for sticking with us. Um, now the hard work is about to begin. Um, I really hope that the two presentations you heard before our break from Eric and Michael and from your fellow committee members have gotten your creative juices flowing. And um, I know we also have asked each one of you to provide us two or three areas of interest that you'd like to work on. Uh, the spreadsheet was circulated yesterday, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, what, um, thanks to Kirsten, our DFO, um, she was actually able to group the, uh, all the suggestions into certain buckets, if you will, for lack of a better word. And uh, identify, she also identified those suggestions. All of them are great, by the way. I, I, don't, I never think there's a, such a thing as a bad idea. Um, but some of them have already been covered uh, by past committees, so I definitely want to make sure that we're not duplicating work. Uh, several, um, um, there are several themes that I see going across. And um, I'm happy to flag them, but I very, very much want this to be a robust discussion amongst all of us about logical subcommittees that we might be able to form uh, in order to tackle all these important issues. Um, if we can reach general consensus today on forming subcommittees, I am also seeking volunteers for co-chairing each subcommittee. Uh, we uh, always want a member from the government side and a member from the requester slash industry side. So. Um, if I could go ahead and turn it over to all of you, just remember, state your name and uh, your affiliation before you speak for the transcript and uh, tell us your thoughts about what you've heard and uh, the way to go forward. Who wants to go first? Ms. Roger, can you hear me? Okay, Roger, hello, yes. Hi, uh, my name is Roger, I'm the OIC for CDC. Uh, I my takeaway from what I heard from the retaining panel members that I, I think it would be a great idea to look to some of the recommendations and see the ones that we can push forward. So I'm definitely willing to table my um, recommendations because they are new and rather look at recommendations from last year for previous years that we can make a difference on, push those through. Okay. Uh, Roger, thank you. It sounds like you're volunteering to be on the implementation of recommendation <laughs> subcommittee that Patricia has created her presentation. So, sorry. <laughs> I'll write that down. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, the, uh, I'll just also just mention that the themes that I saw that I circled were classification. I know Jane spoke to that. Uh, some legislative issues, both old and new. There are definitely some great uh, new legislative issues that have been brought up. Um, and uh, process, there were definitely a number of process questions and issues that folks um, raised in, in slightly different ways. There are some variations on the theme, but I definitely saw a lot of process. Um, and then obviously technology. Um, so I'm uh, just throwing those topics out, those buckets out. Anyone else want to chime in? Oh, Cal is raising his hand. Cal, please. So one of the things that I noticed and Cal, sort of Cal McClanahan. Oh, sorry, Cal McClanahan, National Security Counselor. Sorry. So uh, many of the recommendations are recommendations. Many of the priorities that were in the list from me and from other people uh, seem to cut across the buckets that were assigned to them into a bigger picture that I think this group hasn't really looked at before, which is basically litigation stuff. You know, whether it be uh, something that Kristen had written about whether or not, you know, you should do, whether or not something is classified should be properly the subject of litigation. My issue about in-camera uh, documents in litigation or one of the other topics was uh, to what degree, what, what happens when the, you know, the DOJ or the agency takes a position that is against its own stated guidance in litigation. And so I think that 
we've done a lot of stuff going up to that line in the past, but everything in the past has been sort of agency-centric and sort of dealing with agencies, dealing with how agencies uh, do FOIA, dealing with agencies, how agencies deal with requesters. But FOIA litigation is an integral part of FOIA. And I think the next logical step would be for one of the subcommittees to focus on just litigation stuff to everything that involves what happens after a court gets involved to look at all of those pieces and ad address the four or five priorities we identified that would fall into that bucket would be sort of the next logical step to me. Okay. Uh, thoughts on that? This is uh, this is Tuan Samahan, uh, Villanova Law. I just wanted to second that suggestion. I think at the end of the day, uh, the judicial enforcement mechanism is, is what backstops the operation of the statute, and so it's uh, hard to divorce internal executive uh, agency processing uh, from the judicial enforcement piece of it. I think that. Um, it can help inform uh, executive agency process also to understand uh, a little bit better what, uh, what requesters think is a fair interpretation of, of the statutes and, um, and for there to be some dialogue about that. I, I think also um, some of the reforms, we've mentioned the desirability perhaps of going to Congress, at least from, to my mind, I, I think OTIS occupies an interesting space within the executive branch and has begun to serve an office with respect to, you know, the last several years with dispute resolution, uh, but on a mediation basis. Uh, I think uh, to the extent that there were congressional appetites to do so, and the OGIS, of course, didn't object, uh, that it might be desirable to strengthen OGIS's role so that, um, so that it actually can maybe divert in a meaningful way uh, some disputes that would otherwise end up in court. Um, I'm, I'm just not sure, you know, from the agency perspective, uh, you, you know, what, uh, or what credence they give OGIS right now because OGIS, you, you know, has the power of persuasion that it doesn't, wield a stronger stick uh, with respect to, you know, behavior that may exist in agencies that, uh, you know, needs to be disciplined. And this is Kel again. This actually was one of the things that I did not list as a priority, but I think could be looked at through this is uh, many times you'll see sort of a tension between, you know, how judges treat a statement by OGIS, and, you know, do, do they give it credence, do they defer to it, do, you know, the, the agencies often take the position, well, no, OGIS just as mediations. You know, you need to look to OIP for the really smart people. And uh, we, the requesters tend to lean on the side of, well, no, but OGIS was set up by statute to do this. But there's been no consensus on that. And so that would be a definite area of exploration and perhaps even recommended reform to say, you know, if we're going to go to Congress with reform, say, make it clear. You know, if OGIS is given the power to write advisory opinions, say, and courts shall treat them accordingly or something like that to basically stop the tug of war so that it's not – you know, if, if I have an OGIS opinion that supports my case and uh, agriculture has an OIP guidance that supports their case, the judge doesn't have to go, uh -huh, whichever one I feel like today is given a clear priority. You know, the OGIS writes advisory opinions, OIP sets policy recommendations, or the other way around so that everybody knows which to pay attention to. 
So if it confuses agency employees too, if they have conflicting information. This is this is Bobby from from DOJ. I, I really don't think there is conflicting guidance in what OGIS recommends in their advisory opinions or when they mediate. Um, Alina can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but we we work together closely and. Um, <clears throat> That I, I've not seen an instance where there's a conflict between what OGIS is uh, uh, seen in the advisory committee uh, where in a mediation and um, where it would be a disagreement with our guidance. Uh, the one thing I'd caution about focusing too much on litigation is that I think that's probably the place that we have the least room to make an impact, particularly if we're talking about judicial courts interpretations of the statute. So I would fear that we're just wasting the resources that we have on some of these other more topics where we could be more impactful. So that would just be my one thought to keep in mind if we're talking, when we're talking about litigation. Hi, this is Patricia West with NLRB. Um, I echo um, Bobby's comment about uh, having a litigation um, subcommittee, um, but what what's come to mind in, in hearing um, Cal speak and um, sorry the the other uh, person before him and looking at this Excel spreadsheet um, I'm wondering if we should perhaps have a subcommittee uh, just for uh, legislative initiatives or congressional initiatives uh, I I know earlier today I was suggesting that it could come underneath the implementing um, the recommendations. But looking at the list, this Excel spreadsheet list, and hearing um, the two earlier um, speakers, I, I'm wondering if we should just have a subcommittee um, solely dedicated to legislative initiatives. Um, it could include uh, the two previous congressional recommendations um, as well as uh, the proposed uh, legislative uh, recommendation that Michael discussed about expanding uh, FOIA to the judicial and um, legislative branches. So I just throw that out there as an idea. Patricia, can I just ask you to address uh, Tuan's comment earlier about the need to strengthen OGIS's role? Because that is something that I know you worked on in the last term. So it's something that the previous committee was trying to look into, Tuan, just so you know. Yes. Um, uh, what, what we looked at, um, we were looking about, um, we were reconsidering the model of, of OGIS um, in the vision subcommittee um, and uh, um, when we looked at it um, we certainly uh, I've done a, a little bit of research and so I, I don't want to take up too much of the committee's time but um, you know we saw uh, we can ask OGIS to do a lot of things but they only have um, so many staff members and, and so big of a budget um, that if, if their task were to expand um, even greater, uh, you know, such as, you know, having binding decisions in mediation, um, that would be a whole other almost litigation department that would need to fall uh, under OGIS. Um, uh, but, but, but certainly, I. I just in, in going through all their tasks, I certainly do think that they could use um, more staff and more resources with, with even their current tasks. You're here. <laughs> uh, Tal is raising his hand again. Yeah. Unless somebody has something else to say. No, I'm just uh, trying to watch okay. everyone for those non-verbal right. cues. Anyone else want to speak before Kel does? No. Kel, go. Okay. Well, I, I just wanted to respond to uh, Bobby and Patricia and, and to say maybe we can reconcile 
these two ideas because I do like uh, Patricia's idea of you know, having one group that is basically looking at not so much topic area but remedy area. You know, how would we do this? We would go to Congress. We would have to think differently about how to do it. Most of the litigation things would be probably going to Congress, would be legislative fixtures. If you go back to a lot of the Sunshine Week hearings, you know, almost every Sunshine Week hearing involved somebody, one of the congressmen or senators saying, if you have a way to reduce FOIA litigation, please let us know. That's what I'm saying we should do. You know, and so I, I agree with Bobby that we can't affect how a judge is going to rule, but we can affect how the litigation happens, and we can affect how agencies make their arguments, and we can affect how, you know, to the extent that we want to change the law or recommend to change the law to say, well, yeah, we can affect how a judge wants to rule if we change the standard to make a foreseeable harm standard or something like that. I mean, that every statutory change changes how judges rule and how case law works. And since we have been given, not we, the FOIA committee necessarily, but we, the FOIA community, have been repeatedly begged by Congress to find a way to reduce FOIA litigation uh, or at least reduce unnecessary FOIA litigation or to streamline it or make it not so onerous. That seems well within our mandate. And whether we have it as a separate litigation committee, subcommittee, or fold those issues into things that would be legislative, I think is semantics as long as it gets addressed. Hey, I, I have something I'd like to add. AJ Wagner, Marquette. I can't tell. We can hear you. Yeah, we can hear okay, you. Okay, cool. Go ahead and say something. Um, yeah, so, uh, so I was, that was one of my concerns uh, as far as priorities go as well. As, uh, I put it under enforcement, but, um, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but um, I think, and I, I'm certainly sympathetic to Patricia's concerns as far as bandwidth, um, but I would wonder if that's something that we could think about is the roles and responsibilities of OGIS. Um, I, I, I don't, I'm not entirely clear, but I don't think they have investigatory power or subpoena power when they look into disputes. And, I, you know, I would wonder, I know in some states that that's been pretty effective, and also what kind of authority their opinions have. Um, I don't believe it's binding authority. And, again, I know some states, their oversight or ombuds offices have those kinds of abilities. And, I'm not saying it's a, it's a fix or something that would need some significant funding, uh, but I would just wonder if uh, that might be something worth looking into as well. Okay. Thanks very much. Roger, did you have your hand up before? Yes, I did. Um, okay. I, um, I'm still struggling with trying to focus on litigation. I think the question that comes to mind is, why are most cases, FOIA cases, in litigation in the first place? I think that that's the question we should ask. At least from my, from my experience, um, most times we get there because we didn't provide a response to records, to our request. Most times that's why we're there. And so if, Congress, if we want to prevent litigation, we need to find ways to make sure that agency can respond to FOIA requests timely. That's an important component. I think that's where most of the litigation cases, that's why they start in the first place. And once you get there, then you start talking about because of because once Because once they've sued you, then when you provide a response, the next part is, right, we don't like the way you made your, we, didn't, we, didn't, we, don't, we want to challenge your because of the or the adequacy of the search. So I think we should be focusing, my view is that we should be focusing on how can we make sure that agencies respond timely to FOIA requests? How can we educate FOIA requesters to understand that in spite of the fact that we're supposed to respond within 20 working days or 30, that realistically for most agencies, that is probably not a possibility. And how can work requesters and the agencies work collaboratively to make sure that we can find ways to prevent us having to litigate these cases 
in court. That's my view. This is uh, uh, Kristen. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Kristen sorry. Major Hand, Bobby, go first, though. Bobby, uh, go ahead. I'll start raising my hand. I forgot. Um, so, Bobby from the Department of Justice. I just wanted to echo and just say, uh, and, and something from what Cal said is, I, I think the I think the last thing I can tell you, is we, as an agency or FOIA office, want is to be in litigation. So we want to do everything we can not to be in litigation. And so I really think the goal of reducing the need for litigation and reducing litigation is a, is a very much shared one. Um, but I think that it really, the problem is on the, well, not the problem, the focus is on the administrative side because that's what leads up, and this is kind of what Roger is um, saying as well. So many of these items that we have that focus on the administrative side, I, uh, my opinion would be more impactful in reducing litigation, um, particularly one that I was, I, I, one that I had made and some other uh, folks have also made is, focusing on what are the resources that are needed by agencies to be able to satisfy their FOIA obligations. Uh, something on, focused on resources, I think, would maybe be uh, a beneficial item for the committee to look at. Okay. Uh, thanks, Bobby. Kristen? Uh, Kristen Ellis from the FBI, and Bobby kind of just stole everything I was going to say. Um, I think that one of the things that Kel mentioned, or the, one of the words that Kel used was remedies. And I think that that was something that Patricia was getting at too with legislation. Um, I think lit litigation is a remedy. Legislation is a remedy. You have to look at what the problem is before you talk about somebody. And so while a particular topic, the timing for responding to FOIA requests, resource issues may lead themselves to questions of litigation and legislation, I think the core problem has to be addressed because otherwise then the remedies aren't going to be useful. Talking about remedies isn't going to be helpful until you talk about what the actual problem is. So I think that I would favor less a subcommittee specifically about litigation, for example, than something along the lines of what Bobby was talking about, what Roger was talking about. What I'm hearing Kristen and Bobby say is um, a little more of a process. So it's focused on the process bucket that we had identified earlier. That's kind of Alina, how many committees can we have? Is there a limit? No. In theory, you can have 100. No, there's absolutely no limit. We have just found that we were actually going to break down into four subcommittees, as I recall, in the last term, and we ended up uh, melding together two subcommittees into one, and that, that's what we ended up with three. Um, I see Tom maybe wanting to comment on that, uh, but it does get a little unwieldy, and uh, it takes up a lot of time. Um, for Kirsten in particular, I'm very, you know, respectful of her time as well, because all the, you know, the rubber hitting the road work, um, where we have to roll up our sleeves, does get done at the subcommittee level, um, but it, it is, it's very important work. So. I, I would discourage you from having 100. Um, I would encourage you to try to keep it to a, a low number. Well, it sounds, and correct me if I'm wrong, and this is Kelly again, it seems to me that, you know, every, I don't actually disagree with Kristen or Bobby or Roger or anybody. I think all of these are good buckets and good topics for committees. It's not a zero sum game. I've heard roughly four to five ideas, and we have roughly four to five subcommittees, and I don't see that we necessarily have to be uh, debating whether or not we should do administrative, or not administrative, we should do resource issues versus litigation, we should do legislation versus processing when we can do them all. And they would overlap, and then actually, it would be good that they overlap because each time we have a committee meeting, each subcommittee says sort of here's what we've done and we feed off of each other for the next quarter. And I, like the litigation committee, can follow up on something that the administrative resource committee did and in implement that into whatever we would be doing and so on and so forth. So that by the end of the two years, we have this report that each recommendation basically cross-cuts across all of the topics to provide 
a sort of holistic uh, attempt at fixing you know, what's wrong with FOIA, in the, we think. Okay. Uh, Jason has a comment. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I guess just to step back before we, we you know, dive too deep, um, just some kind of first impressions as an outsider from, you know, the requesting community. Um, from reading the reports, I was really, and, and the, the recommendation and the reports were just excellent, just superb, and um, very well done. I, I think one of the things that I was really struck by was that, um, was the comment that Patricia mentioned where, you know, what are some proposed legislation? Um, what are some bigger strategic um, things that could be done to improve it? Um, you know, there's, there's 22 different recommendations. There's hundreds of different um, issues that you're facing that, that both the agencies are facing, um, requesters are facing. And I think maybe, you know, after the, uh, you know, going back to the pre previous work, maybe it's time to kind of just step back and say, okay, well, how would we really fix it in a more holistic, global, strategic view rather than just very tactical dealing with this issue or that issue? So that, that's just my first impression. Um, I thought that, um, you know, the, the – I was surprised that, you know, there's not FOIA performance goals and metrics for agencies that they have to, that they have to implement as part of their strategic planning process. Um, you know, I was really struck by the prior committee's comment, and, and really speaking as a historian, this is, you know, someone speaking from the grave, so to speak, you know, what publicized our past recommendations, um, you know, you know, here, new group come in here, help us publicize it, because we spent a lot of work, um, a lot of work coming up with these. So, that, so that's just my, my comment. Okay, great. Um, well, that was Jason Barb. I just want to make sure that we put that on the record. Yeah, thank you. All right, anyone else? This yes. is Allison. Sorry, go ahead, Allison. Um, Allison from Department of Commerce, uh, two suggestions. One, I know some people have discussed whether we should have the separate implementation subcommittee, and I was thinking it would be easier to have, say, if you have a technology or a process or whatever committee, and have part of that uh, subcommittee's goal be figuring out which of the prior recommendations they want to implement further or publicize or do a deeper dive on, and then also come up with newer or options of those recommendations. And then the other one with regarding a potential litigation subcommittee. I agree with uh, Bobby and Patricia, the other speakers who said that a lot of it feeds into litigation, so if we could improve search adequacy or resources for staffing and timing, I think that would help drive down the number of cases that get to litigation. So I think that should be a, maybe have these subcommittees look at things through a litigation focus, but I don't know necessarily that a litigation committee would be the best use because it would just be so all-encompassing unless it was specifically focused. That's all. Okay. Thanks, Allison. Uh, Tom, were you waving at me and I didn't see you? I, I apologize. Yes, I'm not sure I'm off mute. Tom Sussman. Uh, I, litigation is a big problem, Kel, but it, I, I agree with what Allison just said, and that is litigation seems to me to fall into two categories. One are sort of substantive application of exemptions, and that's really – we may have legislative proposals, but I think that's not worth a lot of our time. Uh, the other is process, and if you read the, uh, you know, monthly report, biweekly reports of litigation, you know, I, as Allison said, search, search uh, uh, adequacy of the search is really probably the single most uh, litigated issue. And so uh, that's not a litigation problem, that's a process problem. Um, I also think that to get into litigation, we th there may be among the group on the screen three or four uh, participants who had firsthand experience with litigation. And so I think that um, it, it may be difficult to, uh, to uh, you know, it's a higher learning curve to try to figure out for those who haven't had a courtroom problem to figure out exactly uh, how to track that problem back to its, uh, you know, origin, as long as it's not the origin isn't a judge. So,
so, I mean, I, I, I kind of like the idea of seeing how process reforms could reduce litigation. And I, I think we had this conversation in the last advisory committee about, you know, search issues being uh, so, uh, uh, so heavily litigated and therefore we spent attention to that subject. And that's where I think technology has a lot to do with that. Uh, so I, I guess I'm a, I'm a big fan on, I think, uh, I, going back to almost where Alina started, which is uh, uh, process uh, classification and uh, technology and maybe a little bit of a focus on legislation because you'd have to do that to capture uh, Congress or the courts. Um, so that's and, – and I also don't – it seems to me that four subcommittees may be – uh, we, we may be able to handle it. I'm not sure that over four makes any sense at all because some of us like to be on more than one, and that would spread members too thin. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to pick on Alan Bluckstein. Alan, you were in the courtroom once, the very first Exemption 4 trial. Uh, I was, and um, uh, it was a forgettable experience because we got crushed. <laughs> <laughs> and rightfully so. This is James. I just did want to point out that although we had three uh, subcommittees last year, we had numerous sub subcommittees. So depending on how you divide it up, you can see you, you, you can see our work as having consisted of more than just three groups. So. Basically, that, that is to say that if we end up with a slightly larger number of committees, that we have those committees be relatively narrowly focused, it's not necessarily a problem, at least uh, at least from my view. Um, the, the, the point, I, th I think the trick is, is to assign the committee something, you know, relatively narrow to focus on, right, rather than like, you know, if we say, for instance, just the litigation, I mean, well, everything can be litigated, so everything is litigation, whereas it's as, as many of you have pointed out, if we focus on, you know, the, the process of litigation or a very narrow question, like how can we best reduce litigation, right, that then narrows the scope of the work and maybe allows for something productive to come out of it. Okay, thanks. Okay. Alan, did we cut you off? I'm sorry. No, I had nothing further on that topic. Okay, all right, thank you. All right. Anyone else raising their hand? I, I'm I somehow unable to raise my hand on the on the chat. Oh. But this is Alexandra Pella Giles from the Times. Um, I guess uh, whereas Kelsey is a multiplicity of committees, I sort of see two at this point. One is FOIA as it is and making that work as well as possible, and one is FOIA as it ought to be, and that's the legislative side of the house. Um, and uh, uh, I agree with those who uh, noted that one of the main reasons for litigation is delay. I mean, certainly from our point of view, um, that, that's the most frequent reason we file suit is just to get in the litigation queue when we're given a deadline of 2023 if we stay out of the litigation queue. Um, so uh, reforms in-house uh, at the agency would, would, I think, help the, um, the litigation side. And this is Kel again. I agree with, uh, I've been saying I agree with everybody because I'm just an agreeable person. Uh, I agree with James that the, it, it does make more sense to uh, be narrowly focused. And when I'm talking about litigation, like I, I, the people who are saying, you know, well, litigation is everything. You know, that means you have to look at search. It means you have to look at this. Like, no, the, I think that just like we're not trying to uh, duplicate effort with the technology people, for instance. Mm -hmm. If there were, say, a litigation committee or some subcommittee or some subcommittee or whatever, you know, working group, it would be stupid to have those people look at how to deal with uh, search methodologies and the process group deal with how to deal with search methodologies. It's basically a Venn diagram where most of the work is done in the part outside the common area. So like it, the, the items that 
that I raised, the priorities I raised, the thing that Kristen raised about the classification, those are sort of litigation specific issues, like should something be done in litigation? Not what the litigation is about, but how the litigation is conducted. And that is the thing that I think is being left out by all of these ideas is that for good or for ill, uh, the lesson that a lot of FOIA officers learn and a lot of FOIA requesters learn is that regard, and many people here will disagree with me, I'm, I'm sure, is that uh, however you do your FOIA process at an agency, if you get sued, the DOJ will defend you, and they will defend you what, whatever your decision was, and that sends a mixed message to many processors that I've spoken to where they're being told not to do this, but they know if they do it, then an AUSA will write a brief saying it was perfectly legitimate for them to do it. And so stuff like that, if you don't address litigation conduct and or uh, how things happen in litigation, like can ex parte declarations remain sealed forever? Should there be a legislative fix to allow them to unseal eventually? Or can you file them at all? Stuff like that. If you don't deal with that piece of the puzzle, anything you do is going to be incomplete and is going to be subject to reversal the second the lawyers get involved. That, that's the perspective that a lot of the outsiders have. So I just want to put on my DOJ hat for a second, having been there for 23 years. I respectfully disagree with the fact that DOJ will defend every single um, FOIA decision that has been made. There are uh, cases in which uh, agency counsel is persuaded to settle or stand down or change their ways. And uh, Bobby, maybe you can back me up on this. Um, yeah, so I, I just want you to know it's not as clear cut as you think, Kelsey. Yeah, thank you. I agree. I'm, I'm oversimplifying, but it, there's enough of, it happens enough of the time to be concerning. Well, yeah, thank you. I'll let it go. Right. So I'm, I'm hearing lots of different ideas. Um, I'm mindful of the time as well. My, my hope was that we could end our meeting today with at least some subcommittees formed. Um, and I'm hearing, um, and, I, and maybe I'm just echoing Tom, but I'm still hearing a lot of process discussion. Um, I haven't heard classification come up as much. James obviously weren't doing your job. Uh, I'm still hearing technology and I'm hearing legislative. Uh, and maybe woven throughout those uh, are uh, past recommendations. Kristen is raising her hand. If you need some more um, discussion of classification, I would certainly support a committee on classification. It was one of, related to one of the items that I brought up um, and what James was talking about, I thought uh, made a lot of sense to discuss. Okay. Same here. I would, I would support classification. Okay. Uh, one suggestion I can make and see how everyone, how everyone reacts to it is one of the homework assignments that I could give, um, especially if we can select subcommittees, between now and our next meeting is for each subcommittee to come up with um, a, a mission or a vision statement of some sort um, so they can hone in on exactly what they want to be working on and bring that back to the committee next time for any further refinement. That's, um, I'm floating that out as a workshop idea, as Patricia has said. Uh, how does that sound to folks? I'm seeing nods, okay. Um, and how do folks generally feel about um, process, classification, technology, and legislative as four committees, subcommittees rather, sorry. Nods, yes, okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from Alexis, thank you. Okay, thumbs up from Alan, good. Okay, um, do I have any volunteers for co-chairing any of these subcommittees? This is always my favorite part. Okay, James is raising his hand. For James? Uh, I would be happy to co-chair the classification committee. Okay. There were a couple more partners willing to live along with me. Um, okay, Kristen, I see you raising your hand. 
I would be happy to co-chair the classification. Okay. All right. So James and Kristen, thank you. Who else is raising their hand? Uh, Linda, uh, thank you. Alina, this is Patricia. Can you state the subcommittees again? I, I just didn't. So I have process. Process. Classification. Okay. Technology. And legislation or legislative, however you want to give that moniker. Um, I would volunteer for the, uh, the legislate. Legislation uh, subcommittee. Okay. Linda, I hope that's not the one you wanted to volunteer for. All right. uh, no, it wasn't. I'd like to volunteer for working on the process committee. Mm. Makes sense. Great. So I need a uh, non government side for process and legislation. Not all at once. Cal hand is up. Cal, what would you like to volunteer for? I'll join Patricia on legislation. Okay. Thank you. Who wants to work with uh, Linda on process? Alexis, I can't have you because I need one government and one non-government person, unless you want to volunteer for technology. Michael, okay. raising your hand. Okay, Michael, are you volunteering for a process? This is Michael. I'd be happy to do process or technology. Okay. All right. Thank you. So that leaves us with technology. I haven't heard anyone raise their hand for that. Does um, anyone have thoughts about do we need to have a technology subcommittee that's separate? What, what's the consensus on that? What would be the goal of the technology subcommittee? Great question. Tell, like the rest of us, you can see all the technology issues that were raised. One, yeah, I'm, one and goal is that's the thing on is, very closely with the technology committee from the Chief Way Officers Council, but um, there are, and I have passed on all of your suggestions, by the way, collectively, the committee, to the technology committee co chairs so they are aware. Uh, but the one um, thought that I have about the technology committee that would be formed here is that it would uh, involve both the requester side and the government side, whereas the technology committee only has government votes. So I think that's a fair point to make. This is uh, Jason. The reason I ask, oh, who said that? Oh, I'm sorry, Jason Gard, History Associates. I'd be happy to co-chair the technology. Okay, thank you. And this is Allison Dietrich from Commerce. I'd be happy to chair or the co-chair the technology committee from the government side. Okay, great. All right, thank you very much. I really appreciate everyone. Now, the, even the harder part now comes for each one of you, and I'm not going to ask for it necessarily today, but please start thinking about what uh, subcommittees you'd like to help with, um, even if you don't want to be a co-chair. Um, there are lots of opportunities for work, and you've heard um, some folks talk about the fact that there were sub, sub, subcommittees. We actually used to joke about that a little bit at our committee meetings last year and the year before because sub, sub, subcommittees would actually give reports. So we certainly want to encourage that. Um, and I also want to add that um, I also saw a lot of synergy. I hate that word. It's my least favorite government word, but I'm still going to use it. Um, among the subcommittees in this last term and the term before, so to the extent that there was overlap on subject matters, um, subcommittee co-chairs would be talking to each other and communicating and collaborating on overlap areas. So there's always that possibility. Uh, Alexandra, did you want to say something? No. No, that's okay. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, how are you feeling about the decisions we just made today? Is everyone good? Um, Everyone have any heartburn over anything? Okay. No heartburn. Thank you. This yeah. is Kirsten. I just wanted, to, if we could go over these again, who is co-chairing each of the committees? Sure. So here's what I have. I have Linda Fry uh, and, um, oh, no, I have not read my Michael Morrissey. Michael Morrissey for the process subcommittee. 
for classification, I have James Stoker and Kristen Ellis. Mm -hmm. For technology, I have Allison Dietrich and Jason Gart. And for legislation, I have Patricia West and Cal McClanahan. Great. Thank you. I just wanted to make sure Can I get that right, guys? The same page. Everything good? Okay, good. Alina? Um, all right, any last um, comments that anyone would like to make or questions or thoughts that they want to share before we turn our time over to any public comments or questions that folks may have who are watching us out there in, on virtual, in virtual land? Um, Alina, it's Patricia. Yes, Patricia. Um, Patricia Weff, NLRB. Um, may I just ask a, a question about the subcommittees? So I do have a little bit of heartburn over the subcommittees, only because I was looking for um, a subcommittee that could be devoted to, um, you know, helping address um, the previous committee's, um, you know, recommendations. Um, and in looking in this spreadsheet, I see a lot of people you know, were interested in a lot of things that we've touched upon in the past. So, uh, it, you know, uh, you know, um, is the thought with these four subcommittees, you know, I could see maybe um, the process subcommittee technology and the legislative subcommittee um, could certainly, you know, look at the past uh, committee's recommendations and, tr and maybe underneath each of those subcommittees have a working group that can, um, you know, try to implement or address those um, past recommendations. Is that kind of part of the, the thought process in, in having um, these four subcommittees? Yeah, I think, uh, Patricia, to me that sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Because um, I, I think there's a lot of uh, folks who have weighed in and said, yeah, we're really interested in this issue. And then, of course, you know, Kristen, Kirsten and I were very quick to comment, oh, well, that's already recommendation number five. Right. Um, so I think there's definitely a lot of overlap. I would ask each of the subcommittee co-chairs to talk amongst themselves. And when they are drafting up a, some kind of mission or vision plan to ensure that they're also going to be working on past recommendations. Would that give you a little less heartburn? Um, it would. <laughs> Although I, ideally, um, you know, I, I I would have loved just to have one subcommittee to to really kind of babysit um, those previous recommendations. But but I I think um, you know at least three of these four subcommittees could uh, perhaps help move along some past recommendations. I don't think the, the classification um, subcommittee okay. could because I don't think there's been any past recommendations on that, at least not okay. to the election. Okay, thanks. Kel is raising his hand. Last comment. So, uh, Kel McClendon in, in the C, I think that a way we might be able to do that pretty easily without forming a new committee is to sort of form, you know, two people, you know, uh, Roger and Jason, or Roger and Alan, or someone like this, to basically be, their entire job is to coordinate the working groups on uh, well, outreach, or whatever we want to call it, the, imp the implementation and marketing, and they wouldn't have a committee of their own. Their, their committee would be all the other people who are in all the other committees who are working on these issues, so they'd be like co-coordinators for marketing or implementation or something like that. Any other reactions to that comment? I mean, it sounds like there's room for, uh, for compromise and uh, shuffling around a little bit in terms of, of issues that we're all looking at. I don't think anything is set in stone. Um, so I guess I am urging all the subcommittee co-chairs to think about Strongly, so this is my pitch on behalf of Patricia. Also, a pitch on behalf of myself as the director of OGIS. Um, 22 recommendations is a lot, so any help you want to give us 
Um, I know that I would appreciate also speaking on behalf of Bobby. I think he would appreciate that. So um, we, we definitely need the help. So that would be great. Okay. Um, so I don't see anyone else raising their hand or waving frantically at me. With that, um, I do want to turn to our section of the meeting where we hear public comment. Uh, we look forward to hearing uh, anyone who's stuck around this long, um, any comments or ideas that they would like to share. So, um, Andre, I would like to ask you to open up our telephone lines at this time and provide instructions for those of you who are calling in and listening in. To ask a question, press pound 2 on your telephone keypad. You will hear a notification when your line is unmuted. At that time, please state your question. Alternatively, you may submit a written question by selecting all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel, enter your question in the message box, and send. Again, pressing pound 2 on your telephone keypad will indicate they have a question. Open the lines to the public. Looking to the phone lines for any raised hands. We have one raised hand. Please go ahead, caller. State your name. Thank you. My name is Edward Hasbrook, and I am a freelance journalist and a consultant to several nonprofit organizations. I'm one of those regular users of FOIA, one, for whom FOIA is essentially completely broken and dysfunctional, but two, who does not have the resources to litigate, and so agencies know that they can, with impunity, ignore me. Even if they're not of bad faith, there's still an incentive just because of prioritization to ignore those who are known not to be likely to be able to litigate. And I think this committee has a particular responsibility to raise a voice on behalf of the vast majority of FOIA requesters who are never going to be able to litigate. I could go on at great length, um, but since this is your first meeting and your agenda topic is supposedly the prioritization of tasks, I want to start, I, I want to, limit myself to one point, which is what I think should be your highest priority, because it doesn't require legislation, and I think you might actually be able to accomplish something. That is to push for implementation of the provisions of the 1996 eFOIA Act, requiring production of records in any form or format in which they are held and in which they are readily reproducible. Despite having been on the books for more than 20 years, this provision has been almost entirely ignored. Tools such as FOIA Express have been procured and deployed even though they are incapable of satisfying the statutory mandate and should have been excluded from consideration as not meeting the bid specifications. Agencies have made no effort. Their first step in processing responsive records typically is to take the responsive files they use this rhetoric of documents. I urge you to purge documents from your vocabulary. Most of the records that I and others are requesting are not in document form. They're digital files. They take the responsive files, and the first thing they do is they substitute newly created PDF documents for the responsive files. And everything else they do treats those substituted PDFs as though they were the responsive records, which they're not. A starting point toward implementing, I think many uh, – FOIA uh, offices would process records properly in native format if they were given guidance and a ready tool set and workflow for how to do that. That could apply to a lot of different types of records. The most obvious sort is email, where email is, again, take screenshots, which is effectively redacting in a uh, in the client because it only shows some of the headers. Then they put them into PD paginated PDFs. They aggregate an indeterminate number of email files into one PDF. If you get the emails in native format, you can import the emails into an email client like Thunderboard, or you can import them into a cloud-based email client like a Gmail account, and then use the robust tools available in those email clients for searching and mining and making use of the responsive records. A first step should be giving agencies guidance. Their FOIA officers should know in what file formats email is actually served, stored on their email servers. They should have tools readily available for redacting and releasing email in the file format in which it is served on their servers. Beyond that, reproducing records in native format should include guidance for, for example, how to produce a record of an agency's Facebook account. 
how to produce. I'm dealing with a, a, an agency now that is about to be disbanded next week and has said that on the dissolution of the agency, they're going to delete all their social media accounts. They're going to delete the Eventbrite account they've used for keeping track of participants in their meetings. They're going to delete their Zoom account. They have Google Analytics tracking cookies on their .gov website, which enable Google to produce reports for them as to who's visited their website. What would a report of a Google Analytics account look like? There should be readily available templates for how to produce records of these kinds of outsourced accounts in native format that FOIA offices have available. Again, this book law has been on the books for more than 20 years. There's been no movement. The tools have completely ignored it. You should start with tools for redacting and producing email messages, whether it's in .mbx files or .eml files, whatever file format they're stored on agency email servers. That would also make searching a lot easier because what happens is agencies will go into uh, well, they'll task the search out to individual users who will go into their email clients and try to do searches. Email is typically stored in ASCII text. What should be going on is they should be doing uh, greps of the servers for the text strings that people are looking for. Um, but until they start thinking of the responsive records as the actual files and understanding something about the file formats in which records are stored, Rather than focusing their mind on these substituted PDF documents, we're never going to move forward. Please, please, look, you don't need new laws when we've got 20-plus-year-old laws that nobody's even started to implement. So work on the EFOIA amendments of 1996, starting with email. Thank you. Oh, uh, I believe you are muted. Hi, sorry, that was me talking to everyone okay. and saying thank you for your comments, and that might be a great topic for the technology subcommittee to uh, to take up, so I'll add that to your list of, of things to consider. I'm going to turn to Martha Murphy, our Deputy Director from OGIS. Do we have any questions or comments that came in on the chat uh, during our meeting that you want to tell us about? Sure. Um, first off, someone just asked if the public comment section will be um, transcribed or made part of the record, and yes, the entire meeting is going to be transcribed and we will be releasing the transcription as soon as possible on OGIS's website. Um, regarding Tom's comment, uh, does the advisory committee need, and I believe this had to do with perhaps not waiting until the end of the advisory committee to put out, you know, all of the information that we're gathering. Um, does the advisory committee need to make recommendations early this cycle relating to Fermi and the use of technology? That was the first question. You want to field that question? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, my, my answer would be we need to do it. If we're going to participate in this area, we need to be timely. And so I'm not sure exactly where things stand. In, with Fermi now, but uh, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't wait until 2022 to respond to on things like that. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question was, what happens to the records management subcommittee work? Will their recommendations be split amongst the new subcommittees for follow up? goes to Patricia's point that she was making earlier. Any of our returning members want to comment on that? Um, I guess one, one thing we could do, this is Bobby from DHJ. this is, is that uh, once the, the committees have done their vision and they've considered which of the prior recommendations they would be looking into, you could see if there's any gap. Good for um, this uh, James. Oh, sorry, James, go ahead. Oh, he's on mute. I don't know how it's just a little later. I don't want to say. Um, so uh, my, my thought is, is basically uh, actually more of a question of whether we are going to attempt to review all prior recommendations by all of the previous committees or, or whether we're going to be selective. I think it might actually be a good idea to be 
selective and uh, to, to pick on like some of them. Um, it's nice that we're finally, for the first time, going back and looking at prior recommendations, but it would be a little bit of a shame if we had a dedicated subcommittee this term and then we didn't do it again for six years. I think it would be setting a nice tradition if we could, uh, you know, integrate this into the work of the of the subcommittees and set a precedent for future committees going forward to do uh, more of the same work so that every single term, at least some of the previous recommendations could, uh, could be looked at. Last Martha, time. any other questions? Okay. Uh, yeah. One more, or actually a couple more. One is um, someone wrote, scanners for all agencies, more attention to FOIA and transparency. Historically, Congress has been painfully slow to recognize the needs of agencies in this respect. How can the public help you with that? Okay. Cal would like to address that. I, I can answer that. The, you no, know, I don't work in an agency. This is Kel McClenahan. Uh, I have dealt with uh, Congress a lot on this very issue, and that's that's the solution. You know, if if you want Congress to pay attention to FOIA, you have to get Congress to pay attention to FOIA. And as trite as it sounds, you do that the same way you get Congress to pay attention to anything, even if it's not writing your congressman. You know, write a blog post, tweet about it, do something that will get notice to it. And if you see something, if you see something, say something. If if something, if you have a particular story, you filed a FOIA request, and you got back this bizarre response, or it took forever because, you know, they were running it on a 1996 scanner, or they they printed it out on dot matrix paper because they couldn't burn CDs or something like that. Go talk about it. Draw attention to it. The more attention you draw to it, the more people who actually talk to Congress, you know, whether it be in their committee form or like me as a, an advocate going to talk to Congress, we can point to what you did. We can point to your stories and say, look, the people want you to do something about this. Um, Cal, also since you're volunteered now to be the co-chair of the subcommittee on legislation, maybe that's something you can add to your toolbox of things you want to look at. So, okay. Uh, Martha, anything else? You said you had one more? Um, so some of the folks who are um, watching this on YouTube wanted to know what phone number to call in. And so I just wanted to explain um, there were two methods to access this uh, presentation. Uh, one was to register in advance, and then you'd have access to the phone to call in. So folks who are watching on YouTube, unfortunately you don't have that opportunity, but feel free to type something in the chat. We are monitoring the chat. We've got a couple minutes, so if you want to quickly type something into the chat. Um, otherwise, you certainly can get in touch with us after the meeting, and we'll be happy to uh, forward the information onto the FOIA Advisory Committee. Um, I will... Um, uh, let's, uh, I'll ask Kirsten to please give us the email address for that. Sure, I'm happy to do that. This is Kirsten. Um, the email address is foia-advisory-committee at nara.gov. And Alina, Thank we you. have one last question that, or maybe not the last, but we have an, another question that's come up. Sure. And that is, um, which subcommittee will address requirements and auditing of electronic reading rooms and other public-facing tools? Um, and before I throw that out there, I just want to say that one of the assessments that OGIS is currently working on and we hope to publish in the near future deals with electronic reading rooms and posting documents on those reading rooms. So stay tuned to OGIS, um, and then again the question, which subcommittees will address requirements and auditing of electronic reading rooms and other public facing tools? My two cents, um, process and technology could both be looking at those, but 
just throwing that out for folks to think about. Okay. Martha, you're good on any other comments or questions on chat? Um, there's one more question. Um, I'm not sure which, um, but this person should say, so asking about the ETA on the OGIS release date, but I'm sorry, yeah. I'm not sure of the release date on what. I, I think it was the report that I just mentioned on posting documents um, to uh, for gotcha. your reading room. Yeah, and we're hoping to post that, gosh, I would say certainly in the next month or so. Um, so stay tuned for that. that. And yep. by the way, that is uh, the result of a recommendation from a prior um, FOIA advisory committee, actually the 2016 to 18 term of, of the committee. So maybe we'll only have 29 recommendations left. <laughs> so many of them have already been addressed. That's true. That's Andre, all the comments that I saw. Okay. That was all that I saw, Alina. Thanks. Andre, I just want to ask if there's anyone else on the phone line that wants to ask any questions. Otherwise, we'll wrap it up. We are not seeing any hands raised at this time. Just as a final reminder, pressing pound two on your telephone keypad will indicate that you have a question, pound two. Going once, going twice, three times, no hands okay. raised. Okay. All right, well, uh, I just want to uh, close up. I'm trying to very much be respectful of everyone's time. I do apologize for all the technical difficulties we had today. I promise you it normally does not happen, so this is definitely an outlier. Um, and we probably rushed through a couple of the, uh, the topics, but I feel like we got a lot of work done today, so I hope you're all feeling very good about everything we've done here together today. I want to remind the subcommittee co-chairs of your homework assignment, um, and I want to ask all the committee members to volunteer to serve on subcommittees and get the ball rolling because our next meeting is not until uh, December 10th. Uh, I believe, and I, actually I'm fairly confident we're going to be meeting virtually again mm -hmm. on December 10th. It's a Thursday, and the time is going to be 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. And I want to thank all the committee members today. Anyone have any parting words or last comment that they would like to make before we uh, all say goodbye? No, I'm seeing lots of shaking the heads of no. Well, thank you again for joining us today. I hope everyone and all of your families stay safe, healthy, and resilient. And we will reconvene uh, December 10th. So with that, we stand adjourned. Thank you. Yeah. And that concludes our conference. Thank you for joining and using AT&T Event Services Enhanced. You may now disconnect.